If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, we are talking to Ryan Muncy. He's the yeah. host of the Optimal Performance Podcast. It's a great podcast. You should check it out. But we had some great conversations on this one. It got kind of deep, right? Yeah, no, Ryan's been in the uh, industry for quite some time. So we had a lot of stories to uh, share back and forth as far as the industry, technology, where we see the industry going. Talked about like uh, things that were even non-fitness related, like how technology is going to impact humanity and some of the challenges it's going to present. Uh, really good conversation. Great conversations in this upcoming podcast. Uh, some of the stuff we talk about will get you thinking for sure. Now, you can find Ryan Muncy uh, on his podcast, Optimal Performance Podcast, or you can find him on Instagram at Ryan Muncy, that's M-U-N-S-E-Y underscore, and uh, you can find his website uh, at www.optimalperformance.com. Also, uh, this is the last day to register for our free webinar, so we have a new program coming out, Maps Prime Pro. Um, no one else has ever attempted to do what we've done with this program. It's the most correctional, uh, functional based program. I think you'll find we cover areas of the body that you don't see anywhere else. Like your hands. It's, your, it's designed, even though we call it prime pro. And I, th I, I think, uh, when we first built it or created it, it was targeting the professional, uh, as far as your chiros, your doctors, your physical therapists, your personal trainers, Within the program, we, we have this self-assessment tool to help those assess themselves. So even if you're not the professional, uh, it is a program for anybody to use. And most certainly, if you suffer from any aches or pain, joint pain, uh, limited range of motion or mobility, uh, this is a must. And it complements any program. So if you've got your own program that you follow or you're into CrossFit or you have a routine or a class that you go to on a weekly basis – Everybody should have this tool, and this is this is why we created it. So this webinar, uh, you go to mapsprimepro.com and register for it. It's free, and we are giving away much of Prime Pro uh, for free. So we're basically going over the assessments and teaching them, and we're showing movements to correct certain imbalances. It's all free on this webinar. So just go to mapsprimepro.com and register yourself now. Here's what I found. I have found that in our sphere, and maybe you can you can add to this, but in our world here of podcasting, there's a lot of weird people. Like yeah. most of us are kind of bit different. of outliers. Yeah, I, I, sure. I think it's almost given everybody. Uh, it's almost like a green light to fly your freak flag. <laughs> you know, like yeah, because it's yours, right? It's not censored. It's not filtered. You can do whatever the fuck you want. You can right. get crazy on your podcast. You can have whatever guests you want on your podcast. There's no that it's. It's, podcasting right now is awesome. I hope it stays this way. I do yeah. too. I hope that someone it's doesn't. Still, kind of the wild west, though. Yeah, yeah because it's, it's still a baby, all, right? It's still yeah, kind of commercial a commercial here soon. I mean, I still meet people all the time where they're like, "Podcast? What? What's what do you, a podcast? Yeah, what do you <laughs> right? Do? Right? Like, yeah. You know, what do you do for a job, though? Yeah, <laughs> you know? I, I think I think maybe part of it too is that those of us, and I say us because I'm I'm pretty sure I'm in that category, who are a little bit weird. And by the way, I love weird people. Yeah. Everyday normal they're people are, are boring to me. Yeah. But uh, weird us weird people, I think we get there's like a uh, God. What's the word? A cathartic effect from talking on a microphone. It's almost like therapy. We've talked about this when we first started mm -hmm. Mind Pump. Mm -hmm. This we're like God. This is so therapeutic, and it's it very much so is. Do you, do you think that's the weird side of you, the narcissistic side of you? Which one do you think that is? <laughs> uh, it's not because I like to necessarily hear myself. No, um, I think you do. I think you you yeah, fast forward Justin and I anytime. I think you kind of. We'll do. catch him in the car. We'll be yeah. like listening to the podcast, and like Justin and I start talking. So fast yeah. forward just to get to where he's at. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, mostly that. <laughs> we has all to have be, a little bit. That's of that actually in false. Us. I don't do that. I listen to you guys a lot. Oh, really? But when I'm being critical, I criticize myself more. Yeah. Mm. than you guys okay because uh, you guys are perfect yeah, yeah i hate listening to <laughs> myself like when when you finish these episodes and you go to record uh, them yeah. and or you edit them afterwards and you're hearing yourself and you're just like god yeah i hate that and then people comment back they're like you know you have a great voice for podcasting and it doesn't sound like that to me. No, you do. You have a, you have a very mm. good. Sal has an awful one, but yeah. you have a really good one for sure. <laughs> you have that like lean in effect. Like, hey there, hey I, got, there. I, got, listen, I got you. Covered. Listen up. You know, you just yeah. brought something up about being in this uh, this connected world now. What are your thoughts on that? Like I. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I find myself, and I don't express this uh, out loud to anybody else, but I, I find myself battling and struggling with this 
um, once you start putting out information and connecting to your audience and followers and listeners, uh, it's like the, it becomes uh, a necessity and that they want more mm-hmm. and they want more and they mm-hmm. want more. And sometimes I get frustrated because it's like, man, you know how much work it takes to provide all this free information and you're giving me shit because I didn't get on my Instagram today or something. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and my wife, she gets so upset with me sometimes because, you know, especially now that Instagram has, has initiated this stories. I mean, those are amazing. But I feel like I have to post something on there two or three times a day so that there's always something on Mm -hmm. my story. Mm -hmm. And like even on this trip, um, you know, I was sitting out there this morning. uh, I was drinking coffee before I came over here. And it was just a chance for me to to have 30 minutes to myself, which, you know, I I consider myself an introvert. So Mm -hmm. I love going on these trips. And every single day I'm hanging out with amazing people. I'm learning stuff. I'm, I'm recording these shows and we're sharing stuff. And I feel as though I have an obligation to document that and put that on Instagram stories and show every little thing. Like, so, you know, yesterday I got to go, we did cold water immersion right under the Golden Gate Bridge and we were climbing in trees doing the MoveNet stuff. And then, you know, we had uh, lunch at um, uh, Mission Heirloom and mm. you, know, you want to share all this with people. But then, you know, I'm sitting there today and I'm just like, what, what am I going to post today? What am I going to post? Mm-hmm. And it's like, Am I, are you living your life to document it and share it? Or are you just documenting what you're actually doing? Well, I think it's it's this mm, weird thing. There's two things. Once you be, once you feel obligated, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It loses, whatever it is, it loses its luster. There's actual, there's an actual term that psychologists use for this phenomenon. So let's say you love playing baseball. You're just like, Mm -hmm. baseball is my favorite thing in the world. Then it becomes your job, and now you're expected to play, and you lose. It, it loses a lot of its luster, and some people actually start disliking the thing that they like very much because they have that sense of obligation. So, mm-hmm. a lot of that I think has to do with our own mind, our own perception. And so, if we perceive that we're being ob- that we're obligated, then it's going to make it you know uh, it's going to make it a negative thing. If we perceive it as I like doing this, then it makes it a positive thing. And the other thing is. I think it's real important, especially today, and it, it, this is all relationships, by the way, friendships, spouses, whatever. There's there's a certain level there's a certain level of separation that you should have before, otherwise you become very codependent, and you can actually become mm-hmm. codependent on this faceless audience that you have, mm-hmm. and that's what, a lot of people have that make that mistake when you become codependent on that audience to make you feel a certain way, make you feel happy, make you feel vindicated or worthy then you have a problem. So it's important to keep, at least that's what I do. I keep a mm-hmm. clear division and I present, you know, what I think is important for my brand and to my audience, but I also make sure to not share the fuck out of yeah, everything. Yeah, you want it to be authentic too. Cause I mean, you can get into that trap where it's like, well, I have to post something today. I have to do it. Cause it's like the business side of you is like, you know, this is it's volume, right. you know, and it's frequency that's going to win. But at the same time, like if you don't really have anything that genuine to say, or something to share and you're just putting it out like it's just going to turn out like to be this like like just you know whatever like uh, just random idea that you had that like people aren't really going to connect with anyway so yeah, what's you'd the almost point? be better off putting nothing out that day right, right, right that exactly moment. and that's okay yeah. yeah but but to what you're saying Sal I think anytime we are seeking that external validation you're you're removing your locus of control. You know your happiness, your satisfaction with you know who you are or, or how you're living your life or what you're doing. You're you're voluntarily handing that over to somebody else, and that's a very dangerous place to be for your own health, happiness, you know your long term feeling of fulfillment, and you know are you really doing what you're supposed to be doing? Mm-hmm. And and I mean I think you guys know this. Like you you've said, you you guys have sort of found your superpower. You're gonna do this regardless mm-hmm. you know and i think as long as we're staying in that realm then it's okay well yeah, you, know, I, uh, you know what's challenging about it is uh so i'm reading this great book right now called irresistible and it's got a picture of you on it yes yeah, i was gonna say me big yeah, picture yeah, of your face yeah. on it well i sure. taped it i taped yeah. a picture of myself on it no it's <laughs> just my glutes so the the story or the book is about uh uh tech right now and the addictive properties and that it's actually how much of it is engineered to be that right. way. Of course. And how much science goes into that. 
and that no one's really talking about it because really, you know, Facebook and Netflix and all these things, they're all less than 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So we really haven't seen the long term effects. Mm. And in the book, they uh, they interview this uh, psychologist. Right. And she's sharing uh, some of her experiences when she's interviewing somebody that's in like their mid 20s or younger. And she always has to ask them, is this a in is this a person to person conversation or is this on text or is this on a social media platform because when they share their problems their issues the the struggles the fights all these things are going on uh, nine times out of ten it's not even really person to person and they don't their their brain doesn't disseminate the difference of that to them it's the same thing as if they were getting in a physical altercation with somebody in real life and so they were going into uh you know a lot of us don't realize uh what this could lead to in the future as far as its addictive properties and how much they're engineering it to the point which is crazy to me i didn't know this until this book that Steve Jobs and many of the other tech moguls, do you know that don't even allow their kids to have an iPhone mm -hmm. or an yeah. iPad? Yeah. Is that a trip or what? And didn't want them to use yeah. it. Is I mean, that it? should yeah. make us all think twice right about you know living by these things. Right, right. That, that should be your our first flag right out the gates. Is like, <laughs> the dude who invented it says no. no it says it's the yeah. greatest thing ever, but it doesn't right. kids know. It's just like those uh, the Monsanto memes where you see the guy out in the field spraying crops and he's wearing like the, the bio hazmat suit. And you see <laughs> in like, like contagion movies. It's and perfectly shit. safe. Oh yeah. I don't want to breathe this stuff in. I don't want it touching my skin. But you go ahead and eat yeah. it. You'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. Didn't they try and corner him to like drink it? Oh, you know, I saw like, that. On that interview? That was yeah. a French interview, I think. That oh my God. I was like, one. yeah, drink it. I think, um, you know, when it, when it comes to technology, first off, humans we are we're dopamine and serotonin seeking creatures and those are the only two things that make us happy yeah and, right. and we're constantly seeking them out we're constantly seeking novelty mm -hmm. we're constantly seeking uh some kind of growth or learning or to satisfy some kind of either primal urge or to run away from some kind of pain and technology is this like it's like the cigarettes of uh you know of communication in the sense that the reason one of the reasons why cigarettes are so addictive is because you get a quick hit you smoke it, it's gone, you need another one right away. And drugs that tend to do this tend to be more addictive than longer acting drugs. Like less people are addicted to like eating marijuana, more people are addicted to smoking marijuana for that particular reason. Tech hits you fast, hits you hard, you get that dopamine release, it's gone quickly, you're seeking more novelty, and so you seek more of it, mm -hmm. and it, that's why it blew up so fast. It yeah. exploded out of nowhere. We just haven't really learned how to control we it. We haven't like learned that. how to control it because we've never been in this position before. Yeah. And the best example I can think of of where you can see this playing out is pornography. Pornography online demonstrates this very, very clearly and very easily because it's a very clear, uh, it's a very specific thing. And you're finding now- You hear that, kids? Write that down. Yeah. Kids need Viagra. <laughs> yeah. You're finding now young young men uh, in their 20s and teens having erectile dysfunction because they're literally training their brains to react to this extreme uh, novel situation and seeing this visual stimulation that changes with every click with mm -hmm. with a unlimited supply of, uh, of stimulation- their brains are literally changing uh, to model after this. And nowhere in, in all of human history did this ever exist unless you were maybe some kind of like king with access to like thousands of women at your disposal. You'd never experience this. So right. it's ruining their sex lives. We've talked about how hard it used to be to see porn. Yeah, you know I mean, like, <laughs> can I can I say something? Like when I was got shamed, like walking back in the back of the uh, video <laughs> store, you know, going through the curtain, dude. When I was 15 years old, you could literally trade like three dirty magazines for a bike. I'm not even yeah. exaggerating. <laughs> like kids, kids would give you their fucking bicycle. How funny! Oh is my god, that was the holy magazine. grail. The kid that had the magazine. You're like, oh dude. That's how that's how yeah. valuable. You have it was. all my candy, and now we have access to all of it. And tech kind of represents that. Tech represents that because of its easy ease uh, of access. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the fact that we can share so much, so all of a sudden, everybody has a voice, including all the idiots out there, um, and it amplifies uh, some of the ugly in in humans. But it also has a power to amplify the good. It's also driven a lot of these uh, well these amazing you, movements. You use the analogy of cigarettes. The book actually gets into this, and they actually claim it to be worse because with something like cigarettes, alcohol, you know, drugs you have these side effects. Like someone who does a lot of drugs, like you can normally tell. Like you look at him like, right. okay, that guy does a lot of drugs, yeah. you know, or, or they smoke a lot of cigarettes, right? Or he's always drunk. Like you, there's these side effects that the average person can see, which actually makes it more difficult 
to be addicted to it and it be an issue because you actually kind of have to conceal it and hide it. Where with tech, it's become so normal that and accepted that everybody uses it and it's the norm that these people that are really, really addicted to it have no idea. Like, and in fact, the average person, like, think about this. And I, I was actually going to do, I'm going to do a post on this on social media sometime this week because I, I thought this would be interesting to do with my followers, which is here's a test. Uh, if you had to guess how many times do you actually pick up your phone throughout the day, what would that number be? And then if you had to total up the total minutes and hours that you are on your phone surfing the web. So that's not talking on it. That's not listening to music. That's literally Instagram, Facebook, web browsing, YouTube, that type of stuff. How many minutes or hours do you think that would total up in the day? Mm. I just uh, did a, a solo episode and we talked about five ways to increase happiness. And one of them was to ditch social media. So I, we may have seen different studies, but the study I saw came out in March of this year. And the average person spends 116 minutes a day on social media. Mm -hmm. So that's two hours, four minutes shy of two hours a day. Mm -hmm. So that's 10 to 14 Man. hours uh, a week. And it came out to be over five years of your life on social media. And that was YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, mm. All the main the, hitters. Uh, yeah. the, the last time uh, I can think of where uh, humans have all got, went through a fundamental shift where something that we desired so much became just super plentiful and in our face all the time is was with food. Yeah. That's the last thing I can think of where for most of our, our human civilization and we're seeking out food and it's scarce. And look how that's messed us up. Right. Yeah, right. right. And now we're learn but I think we're learning. You know it's funny, I'm looking I know we work in fitness, right? We're in the fitness industry and I know the statistics, right? Obesity, rampant diabetes going through the roof, like people are getting sicker. But there's some interesting signs that are starting to pop up like Soda consumption has dropped for the past couple of years for the first time in a long time, in decades. Um, people are starting to change their habits a little bit. I think it just takes time. And in the grand scheme of things, it's actually a short period of time because the obesity epidemic really didn't kick into gear until about, I don't know, 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. So I think we may start to see some shifts, but there's, there's that period of learning that we have to go through that takes a few generations. And I'm hoping we don't go th through that with technology because – like food, the abundance of food um, solved starvation. It solved malnutrition. It solved a lot of these huge problems. It just presented new ones that we'd never encountered before. Tech has solved a lot of problems. It's the greatest decentralizer of power that man has ever seen, which is a fucking great thing. Absolutely. Anytime power is centralized, you have problems. Um, but there's some side effects that we're, we're seeing a little bit now, some unintended side of, uh, side effects, and there's some side effects that we have no idea. I was going to say, there's, I think there's more that we don't have any idea. Like, Think for a second. Like when, I, when I was reading the book, I'm going, God, think about that. If these kids or these young adults that are in their you know, early 20s that uh, don't even know how to uh, disseminate the difference between a conversation on social media versus an in-person one, what are their kids going to be like? And what's the communication mm -hmm. and conversation? Oh, yeah, especially gonna when gonna VR be? makes its way yeah, into the when, mix. When, <laughs> when those kids today become parents, like how are they going to raise their children? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, here's a question I have for you guys. So recently I was in Sweden for the Biohacker Summit, and one of the movements that – I'm seeing in that community is an affinity towards implants, mm. chips. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, we're well aware of the rise of wearable fitness trackers and things like that. So, uh, you know, the next evolution of that may be implants. And to me, that's a very, very scary thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I've always seen these sci-fi movies, you know, like Total Recall <laughs> or oh, Gattaca and, 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 you know, the powers that be are controlling society through these, uh, technological advances and I always watch those movies and you're like how does it get to that point you know are people how are these people being oppressed in that way but with chips and with wearable technology we're opting into this yeah to that state and it's you talk about decentralizing power we may be opting into actually centralizing it and giving the powers a, a control. You could. I mean, I'll, look, I'll tell you what. Uh, that, that's like a conspiracy theory, it, it's like actually, fear thing. It but. is a very valid, very valid point. Look, yeah. uh, if Facebook was a country- my aluminum tinfoil hat. If Facebook was a country, it'd be the most populated country on earth, and it would have the most, by far, detailed information on every one of its citizens. Mm -hmm. 
period, end of story, far more than any uh, spy agency could ever do, any communist regime could ever do with its citizens, and it was all voluntary. That's how gangster Facebook and it was, is. But it was all voluntary. I mean, yeah. right. you're, you're posting pictures, what you like, what you don't yeah. like, uh, wearables, and then implants, and then eventually hybrids, and then eventually probably not Nano. being a, an organic you know, person. That is 100% going to happen. It, it is our evolution. We've been doing it forever. The airplane, uh, the car, your shoes, your shirt, your shirt, um, the, a dishwasher, all these things are technology that did that. I mean, we can't fly. We developed something that made us fly. We get in it and it mm-hmm. becomes a part of us and now we're flying through the air. Your car does that. Uh, the headphones that you have on your head right now amplify your ability to listen to sound in your head. It's it's a one hundred percent natural progression of my, mankind uh, to to do that. Now, is it scary in the sense that it's an increase the ability of one person to uh, influence or control us? Perhaps it could also be the opposite. Uh, if you look in the if you look in the past when information was less available, so let's say when you know during the Middle Ages when the church ran everything and they were the disseminators of information. They controlled information. You want to learn something, that's where you went. You didn't know how to read, they'll read it for you. Um, they, it was a lot worse. Mm-hmm. When we had access to information ourselves, I mean, when books were first printed, that was one of the, that was actually pro- one of the, the, the things that the church was said against books. Like, oh, who's going to write these books? They're going to control your mind. They're going to tell you what to do and it's not oh, good. We, yeah, we can't have people thinking for themselves. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So I think... Um, I think it's a valid concern, but it still has never played itself out that way. I think what's always happened is every time we see an advancement that changes what it means to be human, the current generation is scared. Uh, you know, there, there'll always out. be a counterculture, and then it'll always yeah. be about balance and self-control, right? Like, you know, even on the analogy you just gave of the car, the headphones, the airplane, if you spent your whole life always in an airplane and you yeah. never touched the ground, you'd have you'd probably you'd probably be very disconnected from society sure, and what right. the world was like, and it would probably be unhealthy. If you always walked around with headphones and you only heard sound amplified, then if you ever tried to take them off and have a real conversation, it would yeah. affect. Well, that. that's the difference. So, You're talking about implants. It's like you but, know, how do you turn off access to you? You know, so you like, can't. Ver- yeah. So versus like, we've always had the ability to you know opt out of something. Well, you, or can you? Maybe, maybe, cool. maybe your implant has the on and off switch. You know, you'd be like the James Bond character taking it out <laughs> with a knife. And- <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, look, I'll maybe, tell you. What. I mean, maybe it's Bluetooth to your computer, just like your, you know, my Fitbit hmm. is, and I can turn it on, the, turn the access you're, you're, on or off. Here's the bottom line: there's yeah. a, let's say there's an implant right now invented. You could buy it for you know one ninety nine. You put it on, and now you have telescopic vision. You can see like a fucking yeah, telescope. That would be cool. How many people would say no yeah, to that? Not, not many. very many at all. Um, there's also, there was, you know, there's this, this question posed in, you know, like in scientific philosophy, it's been around for a long time, but it's becoming more and more reality. And that's how, at what point do you, do you become more machine than human? Is it when you're 50% machine, 51% machine, when your brain starts to get augmented? Um, what does it mean to be human? These are all questions that I think philosophers have been posing for ever. Um, and I don't think we'll ever really have the answer and it definitely isn't going to slow down. There's no well, way in hell. Yeah. Well, to bring it all back full circle, I mean, you, you said the the printed book was a revolution of sorts at that time and allowed people to hear things that they weren't hearing from orthodoxy. I mean, podcasting is doing that now. Mm-hmm. You know, you talk about people, are, are we more weird now? No, you just have more voices and more people are able to, you know, share what they're what is in their head or what's going on or what information needs to be. We are, we are seeing, if you really pay attention, we are seeing, when I say the greatest decentralizer of power, I mean it. Uh, we, we've already seen, uh, industries that were untouchable, that ran shit, be completely turned upside down. Yeah, Uber, look at, look Uber, at, Netflix, Uber, well, Airbnb, l- yeah, well, Airbnb, l- music, Look at music. Do you know that 30, 40 years ago, like music ran the world? Like, uh, you go to third world countries, they knew who Michael Jackson and Madonna was. It mm-hmm. was one of our number one exports. It still is. But the music industry could not stop it. They had all the money and all the power in the world. They could not, and they still cannot stop people sharing music for free. In fact, they had to, you know, join them rather than fight them because they would have lost. Movies now, and, and you know, Hollywood is, is encountering that same. These are hugely powerful industries, probably two of the most powerful industries uh, in the world. Mm-hmm. You're seeing that with media now. Look at news networks. You know that, that a record number of Americans 
do not trust mainstream media anymore. And their numbers are dropping. I think CNN just fired like three or four of their top you know, new editors or whatever because mm-hmm. of, you know, some story came out and everybody's saying fake news, this and that's this war of media. Mm-hmm. And, do, and don't think for a second that that war of media isn't caused by the availability to just share information. Anybody with a phone is a journalist yeah. right. all of a sudden. so Well, they're getting all their leads from Twitter anyways, right? Uh, so, well, you have you, I think it's have, a good you thing. have you watched like news today? It was so crazy. I was, we were somewhere we were traveling and news came on. I never watched news. And I was like, holy shit, like half of the news was reporting on tweets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, that's wow. fucking crazy. <laughs> that's right? true, man. Like you turn yeah. the news, like just five years ago, nobody was even tweeting. And like yeah, now right. the new half the news is centered around what's trending on Twitter right now. And it's like, whoa, that's fucking. And it makes sense why mm-hmm. they're doing it because they got to. Right. Because if they if they're not, it's going to sur- it'll it'll surpass it. Like people want to yeah. people want to know what's- what they say. If you can't join them, beat them. Yeah. I mean, if you can't beat them, join them. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The other one. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's where people are going. They're going on Twitter. They're going on social media. You, you can get online and see. You don't have to wait for the USA Today to mm-hmm. come out tomorrow to find out what's happening now. Mm-hmm. Now, do you, Ryan? Do you have? Uh, we talk a little bit of this on our show. Um, do you have practices that you put in place to try and keep that balance? You know, I, I, assuming you're probably like our age, so you were probably before it and after it, you know, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm 33. I remember, you know, to your point about porn earlier, I remember <laughs> in, in elementary school, we had a uh, recycling bins outside the um, elementary school. And, you know, one day a friend of mine and I, we, we took the newspapers or the magazines out from the classroom and um, we found dirty magazines in the recycling bin and we actually got inside like you know those like I mean it's like a 20 foot long the big green thing. ones yeah like we got <laughs> inside in there, there. And, and we were looking oh, at it was like magazines. you found gold yeah you're like, like oh I mean you're God. in like fourth fifth grade like yeah. you've yeah. never seen this Titties. stuff before whoa yeah yeah so yeah I mean I remember dial up internet you know somebody calls and you get kicked off the internet and you're like damn it mom I'm on the internet <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know and then when instant messenger came out and um Yes. Well, well you, you can see the same thing happening with uh, with fitness. The fitness industry is now getting completely turned upside down. We're seeing it in the small world of like bodybuilding and aesthetics. Like mm-hmm. a few years ago, it wasn't that long ago, you'd go to these huge fitness conventions um, and the top competing bodybuilders had these long lines, you know, an hour, two hours long to get a signature and a picture with Ronnie Coleman or whatever. Yeah. Not anymore. The people with the long lines now are the Instagram stars, yep. the social media stars, uh, you know, and, 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 they're and the, it's not even an autograph. It's let me get a selfie with you so I can post it on social media. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and now it's uh, the people who are kind of spreading the new information for fitness are people like us, people on podcasts and people on social media. And I think that's actually, I think it's a good thing. I've heard mm-hmm. more good information, although it's, there's still tons of crap information. Yeah. I've heard more good information today it's being spread than I did out, before. Though. Yeah, right. but the, right. I, I wonder sometimes too, is that because you see lots of minivans because you drive a minivan now? You know, oh, is, that's it, is, yeah, is it is it because this is the topics we talk about? We it, I don't know, know we dude. Connect with other like minded individuals. We have them, so we all have these similar ideologies. Bro, so it pick- sounds like we see it all the time, but really the same amount of minivans have been sold. Maybe, mm-hmm. because, but I picked up when when you pick up a magazine like Flex magazine, and there's an entire article on intermittent fasting. Like you know that they made there's an impact that's being made right now. Right, bodybuilding.com is sure. writing articles on this kind of stuff. They would have. They would never have touched fasting. Fasting means you don't take protein powders. Why the hell would they ever promote yeah, right. that? <laughs> yeah, to hear a bodybuilding mag talk about not, you know, oh, you might not have to eat protein every three hours. I mean, that's a huge paradigm shift. In yeah, that's that, true. In that world, mm. very, very true. Wait, did, did, when did you learn that one? Because you were in the strength, uh, uh, you know, industry, yeah. right? You had a gym. Yep. You said, yeah, I started my gym in in 2012. Um, my degree is actually food science and human nutrition. Oh, awesome. Um, and I, sh- I changed majors when I was in college. It would have been 2006 when I changed majors. Uh, and, and that was my major. Um, so for me, I did more self-education outside of the classroom um, than I did you know, in the classroom, even though that is my you know, classroom degree. Mm-hmm. So when you take a nutrition course or, or the, the curriculum is sponsored, paid for by big food. Mm. So I'm in my classroom and, you know, half of the curriculum is every science imaginable, biochem and molecular biology and all this stuff. And you learn physiology, you learn metabolism. And then you go to your nutrition class and it's, Hey, if somebody's diabetic, we're going to reduce their 
total carbohydrate intake from 60% down to 50%, and that's going to fix everything. And I'm the, I'm the guy in the back of the class saying, you know, no, that doesn't work. You know, my, I'm the only male in my family who's not diabetic. I've got personal experience with this. I've read about it on my own. I've educated myself. We just took all these science classes, you know, last semester. I know that's not how the body works. You've got this dysfunction in carbohydrate metabolism. Why are you still going to keep that mm -hmm. as 50% of their, their intake? So right. for me, I, I have always asked questions. I want to understand how systems work mm -hmm. and you know, men's health was like, that was my intro into lifting weights, you know, in mm -hmm. high school, I saw that, but I never wanted to be the guy that had to rely on them telling me how to train. So I've always sort of wanted to understand those systems. And in college, like I said, I did all that self-education and you know, I'm reading at the time T nation was, I read every article on T nation between like 2004 and 2010 mm -hmm. and elite fitness and you know, all these places that we could go back then before podcasting to get that information. And I actually started, I, I've tried every version of intermittent fasting. I've just always gravitated towards that. It works for me. So I actually started that really, really early on. I remember, I think it was the TNT diet by Jeff Volick way back in the day. That was, and, and even the precursor to that was the anabolic diet. Mm -hmm. And I started that when I was still in college in 2006, 2007. Well, it's great to be that open-minded to be able to do mm -hmm. that. I, I've always seen myself as an, as an experiment. Like I want to touch everything and experience it and see, okay, does this work for me? Well, you know, you're telling your story and, and two things really pop up for me that kind of really anger me about um, our Western medicine uh, ways. Mm -hmm. Before I go into them, though, I, w I will say that Western medicine is a huge revolution if, in health. And if you had to pick one. Yeah. If you're in a trauma situation, there's, there's no better place to no. be. And, yeah. and it's, it's brought in us incredible advancements. Um, and the scientific method is part of that. Um, but, you know, when we talk about the strengths of Western medicine, it's also become some of its weaknesses. And what I mean by that is we become so specialized in particular study, like nutrition or biology or chemistry that we learn these topics very, very deep, but then we don't understand how they all communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. So you lose that holistic uh, ability. You know, when you learn nutrition, how much of the nutrition did you learn? Uh, how much of it came from understanding uh, human evolution and learning how humans mm -hmm. ate as we evolved? Probably zero. In, in the classroom, yes, you're correct. But on my own, I mean, I remember like Lauren Cordain was mm -hmm. like the paleo guy before paleo was a hashtag, you know, mm -hmm. before it was a popular thing. Um, and I, like I said, I always sort of gravitated towards that because I understood what I learned in science class. And I think, I, I don't know how many people have been down that road and, and have nutrition degrees where there's such a stark contrast between what you learn in science like versus like human versus, physiology versus nutrition, yeah, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure what you guys studied in school, but I mean, you, you have like the, the core classes that you have to take. And then there's like the, the stuff that's relevant to your major and, mm -hmm. you know, in, in food science and human nutrition, we had, you know, you had to learn food labeling and food safety. And, you know, then you have all these like nutrition and, and, um, so we had a medical nutrition therapy that was a two semester course and you have these specific nutrition courses and it's those courses it's that program that's that's paid for by mm -hmm. you know general mills and and you know all that shit mm -hmm. craft and the stuff that you're taught in there just doesn't match what you learned in physiology or yep. biochemistry have have you seen the uh, so obviously I'm sure you saw all over social media the whole coconut oil yeah, uh, is bad for you. And then there's that documentary that people are messaging us uh, on. What the health? What the health? I don't yeah. know if you yeah. saw that. Uh. I actually, somebody actually texted me that and asked me a question about it, and I watched the trailer for it. And it's probably you got enough. enough in the trailer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I wish that's this, all I would have watched. We forced the, ourselves to watch it. So it, when you guys watched that, did you see uh, that it's by the same people who did Cowspiracy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know who the the uh, like the funding behind Cowspiracy was? Mm. It's Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, okay. okay. And. He is, I don't know if it's, if it's him or if it's everybody behind it, but they're pushing, there's, there's a vegetarian or vegan bias Duh. to, to of both course. of those, 100%. of course, to both of those movies. And when Cowspiracy came out, I actually wrote a really, really big post about it and it was well received, but basically, you know, they're ignoring, you know, they're just looking at factory farming and saying that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, we all know that yeah. all, even, even meat eaters, you know, who, who want to eat grass fed and high quality food. You know, we're against factory farming. Mm -hmm. And all of the arguments that they make about how that's a broken system are completely valid. But they ignore 
because of that vegetarian bias, they ignore the fact that there, there could be a solution. There is a solution. You know, we, we can sustainably, even regeneratively farm, mm-hmm. feed the earth. I mean, I've interviewed um, Joel Salatin twice, been to his farm, I've visited it, and, and I know he's just one of the people doing these things. We, can, we already have enough food oh. on, on the planet to feed everybody. We do. It's, it's a it's, huge it's, myth. It's, it's not a production problem. It's a distribution problem. 100%. And, and the best way to uh, that so far that we have found uh, is open markets. Let markets be open and the signals become very accurate and things become very efficient and people get more food. We have plenty of food. In fact, we produce way more than we need. Yeah. Americans throw more food away than some countries yeah. eat. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's, I forget the, I love John Oliver. I don't know if you guys watched yeah, last yeah, week yeah, tonight, yeah. but he did an He's episode hilarious. on the amount of food waste just in the state of California alone. It's, it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the number, but like you said, it's more than some countries eat. Greater efficiency and distribution is what's important. Uh, market systems seem to be, or not seem, definitely are the best. You have other centralized systems. Soviet Union, for example, had thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of wheat that would go rotten mm-hmm. because they didn't have accurate you know, market signals to know where to send them where and how much they should cost and all that stuff. But it is a distribution problem. It is getting solved as, as societies become freer with their markets. You're finding that they're shifting from food scarcity to overabundance, and then they run into you know, Western problems like obesity, of course. But uh, you know, what the health goes so much further than conspiracy. What the health literally tries to make the case that, first of all, all animal products are poison, that if you eat uh, animal products, you're racist. I'm not making that up, by the way. That was in there. Yeah. Um, that it's horrible for everything from uh, the environment to you know, causing cancer. It is, uh, it is a propaganda piece by, uh, by people who are vegans. And, and pe- what people need to understand about vegans which, by the way, I have nothing wrong with. I have no issues with vegans whatsoever. And if you're a vegan for moral reasons, I respect you. But you also have got to understand the moral reasoning behind veganism with vegans, and that is that they firmly believe that killing animals is. Uh, some many of them believe it's equivalent to killing a human. And so, if you put yourself in their mindset, you are going to do everything you possibly can, include including spread propaganda that may be false, to get people to stop killing animals and that's what they did it's really vegan propaganda it's really they're you know they're really trying hard to just by all means necessary yeah. reduce the amount of meat that people eat and so yeah. it's completely false yeah, so it, a lot of the stuff that they say is false it's really unfortunate that the bias takes that story where it takes it because a lot of the information in there is really good information that people need to know mm-hmm. um, that's the problem is you get these documentaries and they pluck Yep. The information where it's like, yeah, there's some truth to that, you know, but the spin you just put on it, it's fucking backwards. <laughs> right, right. So how do you guys help your listeners dis- disseminate, you know, what's what's valuable there and, and how, do you, how do you see it's through a constant that conversation? Like, it is, it is yeah. a constant uh, check. Yeah. We constantly check ourselves. We've, we, we, when we first started Mind Pump, we set the precedence that we would be as open, honest as possible and that we were, that if we made a mistake... Or if we gave advice that was wrong and we found out later that we would come out and we would call ourselves out before anybody else could. Actually, we pride ourselves in doing that. Yeah. What's the biggest thing can. that you've had to call yourselves out on so far? Pre-workout. Pre-workout supplements. We actually wrote a guide mm. um, initially on how to make your own pre-workout supplement because at the time, I looked at pre-workout supplements and I saw the ingredients and what they were supposed to do. And I'm like, this is overpriced and you can buy all these, the, what's effective individually and make your own pre-workout and it's not going to taste good, but who cares? You're saving money and it's, and then when you die, when we dive deeper, we realize that uh, pre-workout supplement, you take out the caffeine and for the most part, uh, you know, it's bullshit. It right. doesn't do anything for it. it's just a stimulant. It's a mm-hmm. flavorful stimulant drink. And that's why people like them. And then it, there's a lot of detriments. It, it causes a stress response in the body, which is yeah. not conducive to building muscle. It causes down regulation of receptors in the brain. And so you end up getting this tolerance and this almost addictive properties of some of these things. And of course, they're loaded with all this you know, coloring and artificial flavor and all this other stuff. So we actually came out and like, hey, don't take a pre-workout. If you want a little stimmy, drink some coffee yeah. before your workout and you're set completely different from some of our early episodes where we talked about like the benefits of <clears throat> taking, you know, arginine and, you know, citrulline and all these other things that well, we said we've, were good. we've also had to do things like, uh, which is a little bit different than what you're talking about, but where we've had to openly discuss this uh, on air. When we, uh, after we had Dom last year, we all decided to go ketogenic. for Dom Diagostino? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And so 
we thought, okay, this will be cool. And I I was a major carb eater. So I was like, I mean, when I compete, I'm doing four, 600 grams of carbs every day. And I was totally fine on that. I've never been someone really, really overweight. And I've always been able to uh, control that, keep myself in pretty lean condition and eat a ton of carbohydrates. I love carbohydrates. Why would I ever want to get rid of carbohydrates? Like, I don't care about this. I don't care about the health benefits. I'm fine. Why would I do that? But I thought, well, that's not being very open-minded, and I would love to go through the process. And uh, after talking to Dom and stuff, I thought, you know what? Like, let's do this. Let's go through it. Let's commit to it, and and then I can talk about it afterwards on the show. Well, we all did, mm-hmm. um, and just I had some. All of us had just an amazing response that we got a chance to share and talk about. Well, after that, uh, everybody started doing. All of our followers, everyone who was on our forum, started doing the ketogenic diet, and then really quick, it went from us never really even talking about it to like looking like it was the staple diet. Mm-hmm for the mind pump and you know we'd start to get people inboxing us saying like oh i'm just i'm getting like the flu from it and i feel awful and having, it was like well stop doing it you know like right. it's not for you we, we never said it was for everybody we just and so i remember having to come out and be like listen i just want you guys to know that like just because we say there's the, here's the positive benefits that we have noticed and we're sharing this information from you and sharing the science that supports what's going on It doesn't mean that it's for everybody to do it. Mm -hmm. It's that, listen, there's some health benefits to doing this. And in fact, like we had Dr. Mercola. It's not not the official diet of Mind Pump. Yeah, it's not. And and in fact, I I don't eat uh, ketogenic. Sal eats like a modified version. And Justin doesn't eat it that way at all. But we do have to, we have to have these checks and balances um, when we share things. Because even if we we don't attach ourselves to uh, anything. In fact, we pride ourselves on not being put in a box. Yeah. We still, if we are positive about something, it's people want to put you there. Yeah, yeah. Well, and even terminology too. We've had to kind of check ourselves. Like I, I remember even with self myofascial release, which is like most trainers are pretty familiar with that term and like how we describe like foam rolling and all the benefits of that. And uh, just listen to people like Dr. Andrew Spina and like talk about myofascial release and what it actually takes to, to release, you know? Uh, it, so it, we just, had to like come back and kind of revisit that and like kind of explain like what we've learned and you know there's still benefit but actually you know here's actually ways to apply it and this is where it may fit in your workout and and so anyway stuff like that we always tend to revisit especially if we get new information that um you know is counter to what we've been talking yep. about we're open to that but one of the most one of the best things you can do if you're an open and open-minded individual you want to grow and i'm sure you do this as well is uh, try to find evidence for the contrary. So mm-hmm. if I believe that, uh, you know, protein is really good for me and I need to eat, you know, um, close to a gram per pound of body weight to build muscle. And I want, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and search for the contrary. I'm going to search for evidence of the mm-hmm. contrary. And sometimes you'll find that the evidence is, is bad, is poor and you're right all along. And that's cool. But it's not as awesome as actually figuring out that you were wrong. That's fucking awesome. It's so great to learn and be like, Oh wait a minute! Mm-hmm. This is something that I was wrong on. And the more often, mind. That, yeah, the more often that happens, the the more likely you are to start questioning everything mm-hmm. and right. learning more and being more open. And yeah, that's that's really one cool. of the one of the first things that I questioned. Uh, probably the first thing that I really questioned in my fitness uh, career, and I, I've been doing I've been professionally in fitness now for twenty years. So I've been doing this I'm for a long guess. time. Mul- eating multiple meals a day. No, actually, that no, was protein. later on. Okay. No, that was later on. The, one of the first things that I visited was, uh, so my goal was always building muscle. I, lo- I ran gyms. Oh, loved frequency. Yeah, I loved training uh, uh, clients, loved managing health clubs. But my personal goals was always build muscle. I grew up uh, very skinny, so I was insecure about my body. So it was always about being, how mus- you know, about being muscular and, be- and getting as muscular as I possibly could. And all the information that you read or read about, especially at the time, uh, in terms of training was body part split. Mm-hmm. This is how bodybuilders train. You know, today's mm-hmm. chest, tomorrow's back, the next day's shoulders, and so on. And you do, you know, your, your 12 to 20 sets per body part. And it's all, that's just the way you train if you want to build muscle. And that's the way I always had trained. And in uh, training any other way was just not nearly as effective. So it was, it was sold in my head. Well, as I was, when I owned my personal training studio, and as I'm training clients, every once in a while, not common, most clients just want overall health and fitness. But every once in a while, you get someone who's like, I just want to build muscle. And uh, and I had a couple of people like that. I just want to build muscle, but I can only afford you know three days a week with you or whatever. And so a couple of times, I would put them on kind of these full body routines. And the results were just uh, incredible. So um, I took my own training and I would read old bodybuilders routines. And I found that a lot of old time bodybuilders did these 
different splits where they would hit each body part twice a week instead of once a week. And so I started playing with that and I noticed that I needed to reduce the intensity sometimes to be able to do that. But I got an incredible aesthetic shape uh, mm-hmm. as a result of that. So I'm like, oh, wow, this is the way I need to train from now on. But then I went deeper. I started questioning everything and I went deeper and I started looking at the strength training routines of strength athletes and bodybuilders pre-steroids, pre-protein powder, pre-creatine. And first off, when you read about some of these 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 people, some of these men, their feats of strength were insane, legendary. Yeah. Um, m- some of them photographed, legit, like yeah. they weren't bullshit. These are they looked incredible. No fake weights. You look yeah. at pictures of these people, and well, I mean, in, just in bodybuilding, look at what Sa- Sandow looked like. Yeah, the, yeah, I mean, he's the guy on the trophy. If you're Mister Olympia, and- that's right. And he was so strong and did some incredible things and looked incredible. And you look at their routines. And none of them were body part splits. Not not a single one. All of them trained more frequently. They all trained with kind of a full body approach. In other words, they would do full body like three days a week or four days a week. And that kind of opened my mind a little bit. And then I looked mm-hmm. at strength athletes and I said, okay, let's, cholesterol, let's right? look at the top. Exactly. Let's yeah. look at the top strength athletes. Let's look at Olympic la- uh, lifters. Let's look at power lifters. All of them train with more frequency. So I switched my split and, routine. And they train movements, not body parts. Right. right. So I trained, I switched my uh, my routine out and I stopped doing a body part split. And this was the beginning of how I created the first MAPS program, which is the programs that we sell on Mind Pump. And so I switched out my routine for a basic full body routine. I got stronger within the first three workouts. Mm-hmm. I started building muscle on a frame that I had been working out for years and thought I had hit my limit. And little by little, I started changing and modifying my routine and now it's more of this kind of what we call the MAPS methodology. But that was my first foray into questioning what I had always thought was the truth and common knowledge. And now I find that to build muscle, uh, for most people, a, an approach that's more of a full body approach or a, an approach that, that utilizes more frequency of training is far more effective. And now we actually have science to support mm-hmm. that. We actually see now that when you lift weights – you get this protein synthesis signal, which is telling your body to repair and build, but it lasts for 48, 72 hours. It drops after that, even if you're still sore. And so it makes sense to work out your body again, albeit with less intensity, but to keep that signal loud. So you just said at the beginning of that to look for science that proves the contrary. Yes. So given what you just said, how would you reconcile something like body by science? Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. Uh, Explain. I think it's Doug McGuff. Okay. Um, But it's basically a a theory where, uh, and he's written a book and a lot of people adhere to it. A lot of the people, you know, we were talking before we sat down and recorded Mm. about ARX and and minimum effective dose, which I'd I'd love to get into with you guys. But yeah, but the the premise of body by science is once or twice uh, a week, maybe once every six or seven days, and you do extremely high intensity, um, like a full body circuit, but it's mm-hmm. only like four moves. I think it's like a like a hit workout. Yeah, it's like, uh, and I've never actually practiced it, so I don't know. Um, but I think it was like an overhead press, uh, like a lat pull down, a squat, and mm-hmm. something else. But um, and it's not. It's usually done like on machines, like a lat pull down sure. or, or a leg press, and and you're going to extreme muscle failure. You're mm-hmm. going to like uh, it's it's like a ten second negative, uh, maybe an explosive concentric i forget the exact prescription. so and he's only training one time a week once once it's minimum it's like once or twice a week you only do one set uh well i could i could definitely argue and debate that for the good for overall health for overall health but not for not for muscle build not for hypertrophy that's not a new by the way that's not a new concept arthur right. jones right. uh pioneered the, the old nautilus circuit. yeah mm-hmm. the, the concept that you know the signal that you 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 really want to hit to, or, or at least the way you send the muscle building signal is you hit momentary muscular failure. And from that point, the muscle building uh, signal has been sent and you want to rest and allow that signal uh, to do its work and do its job. And that was the theory. And it, there's, some, there's some benefit to that, or at least there is some evidence to show that it can work sometimes, but definitely not all the time and definitely not as effective as sending a more frequent signal. I will, here's an example, and, and you can your listeners can, can test this out on themselves. If that's the truth, if that's really how things work, go hit your legs really fucking hard on Monday. I mean, go beat mm-hmm. them up. Go to failure on four exercises for your legs. Get yourself really sore, 
and then dedicate the next six days to bed rest. Yeah, lay on your lay back. in bed. Don't move. Don't 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 damage anything. Let everything just rest and recover. Yeah. Go back and do that workout again, and I'll guarantee you that you'll be weaker. <laughs> yeah. I'll guarantee you that you lost muscle and that you've atrophied. The the there's free, no way you're you're gaining strength off of that. No, protocol. it's all about it's all about which signal is working. And yes, an intense workout sends a loud signal, but when you add up a lot of small signals. Those can overpower that loud, loud signal. And what happens when you train less frequently, like he's talking about, is he's relying heavily on intensity. And by the way, intensity doesn't just affect muscle. If it was just muscle, we wouldn't have a problem. It also affects your central nervous system. Mm-hmm. And if your central nervous system is fried, and if it's taking time for your central nervous system to recover, your muscles don't mean shit. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've used this analogy a million times. Your muscles it, it, are like speakers. And they don't produce sound without a good amplifier. The mm-hmm. amplifier is like your central nervous system. You could have the best speakers in the world, but if your CNS is fucked... Oh, you talk about the biggest paradigm shift for you. That was for me, like coming from the athletic world where every single workout is a max out effort workout. And uh, intensity is the holy grail of, of all your pursuits. And so for me to then step outside of that and realize, um, you know, I wasn't in athletics and I wasn't under that same protocol anymore, but I had to stay in shape and I had to try and, uh, uh, you know, keep my lifts consistent. And so, you know, just to be motivated, I would go some days like a little less intensity and I'm just working on movements and skills and, uh, and then realizing like how much that charged me going into another intensified day and then like applying like three days of intensity versus, you know, five, six days of intensity and like how much better my body performed. And then, you know, and then we dive deeper and I met Sal and we got into more of what he's, he kind of coined as the trigger session concept where we're just, we're going through those same movements, but we're going at a, a, a low to moderate type intensity and it's like just band work or body work. It, exactly. And so now my, my body is fully recovered but, and I'm going going through these same movements in the blood flow and, and, uh, you know, oxygen is, is, uh, helping me to recover. So it was just, it's a totally different mindset. Cause when you're in the gym, you want to kill it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the athletic mindset that you have. And then once I can kind of step out of that and like stop two reps short of like complete failure, uh, you know, how much more effective and my lifts would go up, my strength went mm-hmm. up, my PRs went up. So don't just take our word for it, by the way, this has been studied. So yeah. they've already done studies on this and shown that, uh, if you do, you know, 20, 21 sets in one workout versus seven sets for three workouts, the three workout uh, will build more muscle and be more effective. Here's what you want to understand. The three main uh, variables that you manipulate with resistance training are your frequency of training, the intensity, and the volume. And there's volume per workout and then total volume, mm-hmm. right? If you neglect one of those, you have to really push the other two. If you neglect two of them, you have to really push one of them. And Pushing any one of those variables too hard will result in wor- in lower or, or worse results. So if I took out intensity and I just did frequency and I worked out three times a day, I would build less muscle as well. Th- what he's talking about, what you just referred to, this one m- super intense once a week workout is eliminating frequency or at least negating the hell out of it. Volume is going to be affected as well. Total volume, at least, because mm-hmm. you're only doing one workout. So you're relying, su- you're relying super, super hard on one variable, which is intensity. And that means that it's easier to mess up. Uh, I mean, you have one workout a week to get it right. Um, if you don't have a perfect day, if something happened, well, if you think out they're using machines too. You know, yeah. like, think about how you could injure yourself yeah. if that's your mentality and you're not hitting those movements all throughout the week. Well, speaking of machines and high intensity, low frequency. I would love to hear you guys' thoughts on um, sort of the minimum effective dose movement that you're seeing in people that you know may not be strength athletes like we are. Like we, the four of us are always going to lift. Mm-hmm. Like we just that's what we like to do. Not everybody fits that. Mm-hmm. Um, so you see a lot of people talking now about how they're getting the benefits of you know all the health benefits of working out, but only working out for an hour a month. I or- I have I have two thoughts on that. Like. I see I see the positive side because right now the average the average American steps less than four to six thousand steps a day. That's not even walking for fucking sixty minutes. Right. So And we know that anything under seven increases mortality, all cause mortality. Mm-hmm. So if you if you have a fitness tracker and you get to ten thousand steps a day, that doesn't mean you're healthy. It just means you're not at risk to die sooner. <laughs> right. There you go. Right. So I feel like because that we are we are going so far so far backwards so fast uh, in in the grand scheme of moving and exercising 
that someone doing uh, even something that bare minimum, I feel like, fuck, you know, it's a step in the right direction, at least. Right. Um, but I, I, I think there's. There's there's so much more benefits to moving more frequently with less intensity than doing something super intense one one day like Sal goes mm-hmm. back to the central nervous system. But I mean, everything from blood flow and oxygen and nutrients getting to the body and just being connected to your muscles. I mean, one of the things that was mind blowing for me getting uh, getting older now, 36 years old. And when I was in my early 20s, even as a trainer, I never did any mobility work. I never did any corrective stuff. Sure, I told my clients to do it, some of that because they were old and they complained of aches and pains, but I never applied it. I really never did until I had to. And then I then it like dawned on me like, holy shit, like what's really happening here? And and we we really just kind of graze over it. We talk about like aches and pains and things like that. It's like, oh, I've got a bad shoulder. Oh, I've got a bad knees. Oh, I got bad. But wait a second, like where? How did it get there? And why did it get there? And a lot of it is a, a loss of connection. Mm-hmm. We lose connection to our own body that's fucking nuts and i was blown away just this last year or two when i had uh dr brink who's a good friend of ours movement specialist and i had him break me down you know and pick me apart where he, what he sees and he just he like ate me alive on my feet he's just like dude you you have no connection to your feet whatsoever how crazy yeah. is it that we lose that connection to our body to our ability to move and i mean you only get one body. Like this is it. This is the vessel yeah. that takes you through everything that you're going to do. Like how do we? How, how does that happen? The the the, yeah. the brain develops uh, through trying to necessity, be more use, and practice. So you take a child. You 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 never speak a word to them. Let them grow up never talking. Once they reach a certain age, you can teach them language, but they'll never be able to speak normally. Uh, we're, as children, we put shoes on. As children. We're taught to sit down. We're taught to do certain things. A lot of these things aren't going to, aren't, we're not going to get like super, super good, but we can make improvements. But a lot of the damage, unfortunately, but we talk about feet. Adam's talking about feet. Like you can work on your feet all you want. You ain't going to have the connectivity to your feet that a, a hunter gatherer maybe had because we've been in shoes for our whole lives. But I have a great analogy for you in regards to, um, you know, what you're talking about with this minimum effective dose. First, first off, before I get into my analogy, Minimum effective dose changes all the time. Mm, it's yeah. very individual. So, because yeah, you adapt to that. Yeah, quickly. if you're super inactive and you're on the couch all day long, the minimum effective dose to get your body to change in the positive is very little. Yeah, it's like a 20 minute walk <laughs> yeah. every day. That's it. The, the minimum effective dose for me, who's active uh, pretty regularly, is a lot higher. So, that changes all the time. So, that's that's number one. But when we talk about the systems of adaptation, and make no mistake, getting stronger burning body fat, improving performance and mobility are all systems of adaptation. Your body is adapting to stressors. Believe me, your body needs a reason to add calorie expensive muscle to its body. It's not going to do it for no reason. So these are all adaptation signals. Now, if we look at other systems of adaptation of the body, they all have the similar way of working. Let's use your skin, for example. Your skin adapts to the sun. And the way it adapts to the sun to protect itself from the damage uh, that the sun can, uh, can produce is it gets darker. You get a tan. So if you take an individual and you want them to get a good tan, to build a nice, even tan, mm-hmm. what's more effective? One super high-intensity sunburn <laughs> day you know, every other week yeah. or a little bit of exposure every single day? Which turn one's going to give you- Turn into bacon. No, I, I've never heard that particular analogy, but the one I've always used was uh, like, so take Tiger Woods or any golfer. And you tell him you can only hit 700 golf balls a week. Mm-hmm. Are you going to hit 700 on Monday and then not come back until the next Monday, or are you going to hit 100 a day every single day? You know, you're, also. you're you're especially like from a from a skill standpoint because mm-hmm. you never reach fatigue, you never reach compromised uh, muscle movement. Mm-hmm. You, you you you're more focused on the integrity of that movement and that nervous system connection than mm-hmm. you know swing 699 is going to be awful. What are you learning? Well, You're learning the, bad yeah. recruitment well, that, right. And now, we, and then you can take it a step further, and we break it all the way down to the learning curve and from the brain side. Like think of learning a language. If you only had nine seven hundred hours to learn a language, would you do it over the course of yep. so or one day? You know, so, or, yeah. <laughs> I, I am so lucky to be able to have met a uh, memory grand champion, Matthias Ribbing. And if you guys want, like, to go. On your show, I, I will connect you to him. Please, like, he would be a fascinating person for awesome. you guys to have. Um, but 
when I was in Sweden, he, we had dinner one night and, and he was explaining to my wife and I how we could learn a language faster. And he absolutely despises all of the technology that's available to us to learn a language now mm-hmm. because he understands how the brain works. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You, you understand a system and then you can apply that to whatever it is that you're trying to do. But our visual memory is so much stronger than verbal or language memory. And that goes back to just, you know, it's just how we're wired. It's the first it's thing we probably works. saw things before we ever learned how to talk, right? Yeah. And so he says, you, you look up any language you want to learn. You look up the 1,000 or 2,000 most commonly used words in that language. And then for um, however many days it takes, you take, you break it down into chunks of 50 and every single night you attach an image to those words. Oh shit. Hmm. And he can explain like the process of using images to remember things. Um, mm-hmm. I, last year at Paleo Effects, he's, he's Swedish. So English is like his third or fourth language. And he memorized the Austin newspaper in a non-native language in like five minutes and then came on the podcast <laughs> and was just reciting things back because he's attaching words to mm-hmm. images. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. So like we wanted to learn Spanish. So you just Google thousand most common words in Spanish. And then, you know, the first 50 or, you know, they're, it's all like L and Los and, yeah. but you, biblioteca. Atta- yeah, you attach <laughs> those. So like, okay, biblioteca is, is library. You would um, imagine like a giant book and you can remember a book much more easily than hmm. you can remember mm-hmm. the word. But if you do 50 words like that every single night, in a week, you're at, what was it? Uh, 350. 350 words. So you hit, it takes you like three weeks to learn the first. Wow. You know, wow. That's, that's even, that's that's even like, more effective but then, that's like than this. singing it. <laughs> right. right <laughs> but but yeah. then you, you once you learn the words, it's much more easy to learn how to use them in context and converse mm-hmm. because you understand them and you can watch, like watch something in Spanish, watch Narcos in Spanish and, and you can learn or, you know, have these conversations and you learn. But to, that that completely matches what you're saying about frequency. Small doses of exposure. You know, you never get tired. You you are staying on point. You're focused. Mm-hmm. It's, it's better quality. I'll tell you if because if you're looking, of course, if you're trying to maximize muscle growth or maximize performance, there's a way you train. And if you're looking for longevity and just optimum health, uh, there's a there's a the principles are similar, but it's different, right? If you look at studies of the world's longest living people. Um, you know, they call them the, uh, these areas, uh, blue zones, mm-hmm. blue zones in the world. And they've done these studies and there was one huge one done. I think National Geographic funded it. Um, they found, uh, less things in common than they thought they would. They thought they'd find some silver bullets, but they didn't, but there were certain things that they did find in common and none of them, none of it was uh, super high intensity exercise. It was daily, uh, purposeful activity. So it was, uh, the, you know, the old man, he's 85 years old every day, gets out, goes on his little boat, rows out in the ocean and goes fishing. Or the woman who climbs up the mountain to collect berries or to milk her goats or whatever. It was daily uh, purposeful activity. So going for a walk, literally, if you're just looking for health and longevity, it's a very easy thing to do is walk everywhere every single day. That alone will make a huge difference. Mm -hmm, Now, if you want to add a strength component to it, which I think is hugely underrated, I do believe 100%, I'll make this argument all day long, that strength training is the answer to aging more than anything else. Mm -hmm. It combats all of the things that happen with age from uh, all the way down to a cellular hormonal level all the way up to, you know, just mobility and strength. You know, do some strength training every day. It doesn't have to be tons. You could pick two or three exercises. Uh, you can work your way up to higher intensity. But when you first start, just do the movements, feel a little bit of a burn, feel what's going on, get used to the movements. Do a little bit every day, um, and you'll get tremendous benefit from doing that. Now, if you want to take it a step further and you want to be more advanced and build more muscle and whatever, then there's a little bit of a different approach. So when you said, and I completely agree with you, but I'm just looking at the trends and what, mm-hmm. what I'm seeing happening in the world. A lot of the people who are the biggest proponents of the high intensity, uh, minimum workout time are people who are chasing immortality, anti-aging longevity. Mm-hmm. It, and, and it doesn't match to the science, which is fascinating yeah. to me because everything else they do is so grounded in science. Well, hmm. what it does is it it appeals uh, quite a bit to the yeah, certain mindset, to the mentality yeah. of someone who considers themselves to be a biohacker or somebody who wants to learn how to optimize, right? So if you look at the mentality, it's 
all based around doing the minimum. They're, they're freeing their time up for all these other things they're incorporating. Yeah, yeah you're hacking yeah. it, right? Yeah. You're hacking it. So, oh, I only work out one hour a month or whatever. So I've hacked that particular thing. Well, I feel the like problem that, is it doesn't work. I think that's the the argument where I said I, where I said there there's two sides to it, right? I feel like you could debate that if it's better than no workout, right. and if I was only gonna do. The bare minimum sure. of 20 minutes, what would it look like? And that's probably what it would look like. Super intense, 20 minutes. I mean, if that was like all I got. But I mean, you can't compare it to, you know, three hours spread out over three. It's just not even comparable. But if you're somebody who doesn't even want to exercise, but you recognize, okay, <laughs> there's yeah. health benefits to it. I'm too busy doing all the other biohacks, like sticking things in my ears, my nose, and taking weird pills and shit like that, that okay, I, I don't have a lot of time for exercise. What it's the least I have to do to get some benefits from it? Okay, this is the science supports doing this one, into, but not over, you know, three days a week of one hour of walking and doing other movements. I just, you know, it's, I think that's, I think that's the argument, right? Is that what, yeah. where they're trying to come from? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, yeah, it just, it just doesn't work. I mean, from a muscle building perspective, that signal dies off pretty quickly. Um, central nervous system takes a little longer to heal. If it's more than what you're currently doing, you'll see some, some change, but you'll, you'll quickly, quickly halt. I think the, the appeal of it, uh, just like when Arthur Jones came out with his, you know, one set to failure per body part type deal, the appeal is I don't have to work out that much yeah. and it sounds different. It sounds opposing. And anytime, I mean, here's a little key, little trick. If you want to sell a lot no, of anything, it's always less is more. Yeah. Right? If you want to sell a lot of anything, just say the opposite of what everyone else, uh, yeah. else is saying. Five minute abs. Yeah. yeah. And you'll, and you'll see all of a sudden people are like, Oh shit, that's the answer. You know, like, yeah. You know, so carbs are bad. You know, that got real popular because fat was bad for so long and whatever. That, so. or people always want to hear what's the least, right? Yeah. 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 What's, that, the, what's the fastest? What what's the least I got to do to get there? Nobody wants that's to That's what has the appeal. Everybody's trying to avoid the, the labor intensive stuff or mm -hmm. like uh, they look at that as like arduous. Like I'm already working really hard at my job. Why do I need to work? at you know my body and, and, and improve my body like that's just another job like i'm adding to the mix in reality what you have to understand when it comes to optimizing your life is not a time not you, you don't want to look at things and necessarily say time spent or uh is time wasted or whatever you want to look at the return on mm -hmm. that particular time so i'll give you an example yeah, the roi yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example like uh meditation Meditation for me was, it still is rather difficult to do regularly, but it was impossible before because in my mind, I'm sitting there for 30 minutes and I'm not doing anything. When I could be reading, I could be working out, I could be working, I could be doing something something else. Like I'm just sitting there like, and for what? What's the big deal? If I want to be, if I'll go to bed tonight and I'll sleep and then they'll calm me down type of deal. But when you when I started to realize that that 30 minutes of meditation translated into another hour or two of productivity. And I don't mean that I spent an hour or two working more, just that when I did spend an hour working, I was so much more effective. Mm -hmm. Then I started to say, wait a minute, uh, it's not 30 minutes that I'm actually taking, I'm actually trading 30 minutes for 60 minutes. Imagine if you could do that all day long. Imagine if you, imagine with money, what if I could give, what if for every dime you gave me, I gave you 15 cents back. You would give me all the dimes you had and you would continue doing that. Yeah. Because you'd make, you know, you'd make way more than you invested. Absolutely, exercises like that. Now, at some point, there are diminishing returns, and that's the extremes. I'm not talking about that, but you want to build muscle, you want to burn body fat, you want to feel better, you want to move better. It doesn't take a shit ton of time. You're looking at maybe a grand total of, I don't know, four hours a week for the average person to get really, really good results. Maybe five a week total. That's not much time at all. But that five hours. Once it starts to show up in the way you feel, your body, the hormonal changes, all these different things, it's going to yeah. turn into something like 10 or 15 or 20 hours of better productivity and mm -hmm. quality of life. Well, I, I yeah. like this topic too because this is a lot of what um, inspired MAPS is we do teach uh, the minimal effective dose. I mean, that's really uh, mm -hmm. MAPS, uh, MAPS Red, our foundational program, MAPS Anabolic, is literally a two to three day a week routine. That's it. And it's a full body. You're only doing like three sets of an exercise. It's, you know, it's not designed to kill you. The Which is funny because that's what been like the most criticism we've had because we get the other side of, you know, the audience of all the people that want to live in the gym. Like, I right. want to be there. Seven, like, you tell me I have to work out only twice, you know, or three yeah. times a week. Yeah. You know, like, like we had a little bit of oh, a revolt. That's that. the, yeah. the hardest people to convince to trust the process are the ones that are already addicted and are over over training. Right. Mm -hmm. They're going in seven 
seven days a week, hammering muscles like crazy, beast mode, all right. that stuff, right? right. So they're, they've fallen into uh, the sexy side of all the marketing and stuff, right? right. If right. you want to look like me, you got to train train harder than me, beast well, mode. Whereas people, you know, coming from your audience, they're, they're going to see that message and be like, oh, I can't do that. I can't have like live in the gym for seven days a week. You know, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I got a full-time job. I got kids. You right. know, it's like, like so I can understand where they're coming from. Like, like once a week. Oh, yeah, cool. That's all I have to do. Yeah. Yeah. But when you when you set those wheels in motion and really work with your body, uh, the body changes and it responds and it doesn't feel like you're forcing it. It really doesn't. It's uh, it's because your body wants to change. It, it, you know, I've said this before um, on previous podcasts. If, if you're fighting your body, uh, you'll lose. At some point, you'll lose. Eventually, right. your body's going to win. You're going to either get sick or hurt or something's going to happen to you. So you're not going to win. Learn how to work with your body. And proper resistance training does not look like, for most people, for the vast majority of people, does not look like hours and hours and hours in the gym every single day. I think the people that, in fact, the people that respond and do well with that, I think do well in spite of that. I don't think they're doing well because of that. Mm -hmm. For most people, I mean, if you, if you, and it all goes down to programming. I want to be clear now. If you go into the gym four hours a week and you're doing shit programming, you're not going to get much out of it. But if you've got good exercise programming, you're doing the movements that matter, you know how to phase your workout so you're training for different types of adaptation and you're organizing them properly and you're doing the right, you know, all of it, the programming is, is good, um, you're going to get a huge return on that time being spent and your body's going to change and the comments that we get all the time from people who've been working out for years is, I can't believe I'm, you know, building muscle like this or I can't believe I'm getting stronger or I can't believe... I'm burning body fat. And I asked them, well, why do you mean, what do you mean you can't believe? And they're like, well, it feels like I'm not really doing a lot to do it. I'm like, well, that's because you're doing the right thing. <laughs> right. You know, it makes a huge difference. So, yeah. yeah. Well, we talk about how you should feel when you walk out of the gym. Like, you should feel it, better than yes. you did when you walked in. Yeah. You shouldn't feel mm -hmm. defeated. Right. Like, that's not, but, but that's the message. Again, a lot of like when, before we even started Mind Bump, a lot of when I started my social media, like how I was that guy because I was a men's physique guy and I'm in this competing world and it's most certain everybody's trying to be a fucking martyr. Like, mm -hmm. it's about who mm -hmm. suffers the most, oh, yeah. who trains harder, who starves harder. Yep. Come train harder than me. Beast mode this. No days off. Like, it's crazy. So this is interesting. On the flight out here, I actually watched a documentary called The Rise of the Sufferfests. Have you seen this? <laughs> no. Have you seen this? No. no I have to watch that. Uh, it's all about, like, obstacle course racing. And oh. and I, as I was watching it, it's, it's really fascinating. I mean, there, there's some really interesting questions posed. And um, – I made notes and, and one of the things that I wrote down was, you know, is this, is, is obstacle course racing well, today what bodybuilding and physique stuff was? Because I, I competed in that too. So, oh. so when you say suffering, like I know like, you know, you had that drop set on the hack squat and like you just had to go somewhere else in your mind that like you got to find <laughs> something that's going to get you through that. Um, so do you think that the rise in obstacle course races and, and, and all these weird things like Maybe people who are not into bodybuilding well, are, we are finding well, that. I'll tell you exactly like, what Why do is. we want to suffer? I'll tell you exactly what this is. And we do talk about this on Mind Pump. Is a lot of people have a very poor relationship with exercise. And they don't realize what they're doing. And a lot of the times, and this is just, this is purely from experience. This is from training thousands of people. And you get these clients and they look at exercise as almost like a form of punishment and they're punishing themselves. In fact, most of my obstacle course racers, most of my marathon runners, most of them did not have a good relationship with exercise. They did it because it was the only way that they could get in shape was to prepare for this torture. And I would argue that it's not just the relationship with exercise, but at that point in their own evolution, it's a relationship with themselves absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Uh, they go uh, hand in hand. Absolutely. They now, go hand in hand. Now that all being said... Because uh, that's 100% true. And it does tend to attract... Marathons did this before obstacle racing. Like, that's not everybody. Yeah. That's, I think, it does tend to attract yeah. the person that wants to beat themselves up, punish themselves, or needs an external goal in order to motivate themselves to go to the gym. And and to be fair, I mean, I think you guys have talked about this. And I know for me, I mean, we all were at that point in our lives mm -hmm. at some point as well. I mean, mm -hmm. that's why I got into lifting and strength and physique and you know modeling and that's why you guys got into lifting as well too. well I, and I was, I was just going to say that there is another side to that there is a very cathartic uh effect that comes from exerting yourself mm -hmm. uh hitting reaching your limits 
and realizing that you're stronger uh, and tougher and more resilient Mm -hmm. than you ever thought possible. And in today's lifestyle, I don't see, first of all, I don't see obstacle course racing uh, declining in popularity. I only see it increasing. And the reason why I see it- The numbers that he presented are, are, they're staggering. The the reason why I think it's exploding and will continue to explode is because our lifestyle is uh, posh. We're, yeah. we're, we're all super comfortable. We're all a bunch of pussies. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we, we don't experience temperature changes, mm-hmm. so the, uh, air conditioning and heating. We don't experience uh, lack of food. We eat three meals every single day, sometimes two or one. Nobody ever fasts for a day, and if you do, it's like it's scary. We don't feel pain. Um, our bodies evolved experiencing mm-hmm. these stresses, and so we develop all these nervous disorders like anxiety yes. and paranoia and depression. Deep down, we're craving all this. We're, we need to ch- challenge ourselves. Oh, yeah. this, this is why uh, contact sports are so popular. Like, yeah. Why do we like watching this freaking well, crazy and hearing the, the, you know, the story behind it? Here's the argument to that and w- the positive side to that, and we just literally came off a great conversation about stressing the body for adaptations and how the how there's a way to do it and not do it i feel the same way with obstacle course racing with yeah. marathon runners i think there's even competing i think there's a a lot i got a, a lot of positive things uh health wise from actually competing i think stressing the body uh intermittently is actually really good yeah. mm-hmm. it's, it's peaking people- you're experienced the peak of that which but it has you have to go through the process of training leading up to that whereas you could see somebody abusing the obstacle course racing uh, bodybuilding you know crossfits you know whatever they're they're competing in uh but you know they're doing it like way too frequently you know they're not really giving their body a chance to uh you know live adapt and like go through the training and the strengthening and uh leading up to a peak or or it's like what he said it's it's the relationship that they have with themselves with it like so i remember because I, I I love asking you. Well, why do you do this? Like, wh- right. what drives you to do it? Oh, I get. It's normally it gets. I get in great shape, and I, I, they they have this like connection to like how they look or whatever, or maybe the competitive side of winning with it. Where you know, like, if you're doing it for health, there is a healthy way to do it, and there's a healthy way I feel like to incorporate it into your lifestyle. But most people don't get into it. They get it for into it for either the addictive properties, yeah. or they get into it because of it. It's, yeah. It it makes them look a certain way. Like, or it's the only way that they can be in shape is if they're training for Well, they associate that with being what, in shape. What was the moment for you guys where you made that transition? Because I think we're, we're all kind of on the same page that we're, we're all down to suffer and, and we need that. We're, we're too comfortable. But mm-hmm. you guys got into bodybuilding or, or strength sports as kind of the gateway into your own like self-evolution. Mm-hmm. What, what was the point for you that it mattered more what you did with those lessons outside the gym? Mm. as opposed to you know just how much you squatted or what you looked like with your shirt off. So I had mm-hmm. a clear uh, I had a clear event. There was a single event that happened to me that, that made this fundamental shift for me. And then I, I also happened to be in an environment that fostered uh, that change. Uh, before I get into that, I do want to say, though, with uh, what we're talking about with these races and intensity-based t- type events – we we can't discount the psychological and emotional benefits that come from those. Well. No, so, that's why. I think, so you can train I think, your body. I think the you stress. Can, that's what I meant by yeah. it's right, putting I, the body through a stress. I, there's lots of positive. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, one of the most life changing events I've ever done was I did Seal Fit, um, the 20x challenge. I mean, mm. it was 12 days. I mean, yeah, not good for your body. Gosh. No, great for your psyche. Right. I mean, it, it, I learned lessons that I still go back to, and I mean, exactly, it's, it's amazing. And and it, and that's my point. And that's why I asked what that moment yeah. is for you guys. That because I'm not saying that obstacle course racing is bad. I'm not saying that bodybuilding is bad. I mean, it's, it's just, it's how these people are. It's, it's, it's our own individual vessel that we're using for that. Mm. Uh, of course. I had a fundamental shift, uh, years ago. Uh, so I'd been, uh, I've been into lifting weights since I was 13, driven heavily by insecurity. I was a skinny kid growing up and I wanted to build muscle, but I'm also, uh, very passionate. I get to be very obsessive. Um, I tend to be, excuse me, very obsessive with subjects that I get into and uh, like, and I do this with anything that I really get into. I got really into the science of the body and building muscle and I learned everything I possibly could and I abused my body uh, quite a bit. I abused it with uh, supplements, with workouts, with nutrition um, to try to build, build, you know, more and more muscle. Mm -hmm. So I did this for a long time and right around the age, I'd say I was probably either 29 or 30, uh, my body retaliated in a very, very big way. So I've always had a tendency towards gut issues, as, even as a child. I was a little more sensitive to food than most people, but I was okay. I could eat things and it wasn't a problem. Well, now, you know, I had been for 15 to 15 or 17 years 
of stuffing my face with the same kind of foods all the time without paying attention to quality of food, with taking supplements day in and day out, several times a day, protein powders, bars, you know, exotic supplements, pro-hormones when those were over the counter and they were legal, like just going crazy that my body retaliated and I had severe gut issues uh, to the point where I thought I had maybe Crohn's disease or something. Like I, I lost 15 pounds in a very, very short period of time. I Nothing I could eat would stay in me. I got very sick, very weak. It was very, very scary. Got lots of tests done. Nobody could figure out what was going on. And at that time when this was happening, I had owned a wellness facility uh, or personal training studio slash wellness facility. In my facility, I had some workers in there that were very holistic with their approaches. And I, I love the fact that they were holistic. They were different than me, which meant we could offer different things to our clients. I also respected and honored their methods. I didn't use them myself because I'm a meathead, right? I lift weights and I know you're telling me about, you know, avoiding certain foods and don't eat artificial sweeteners and, you know, I need to meditate and all this, but whatever, I'm just here to build muscle. I don't care. That's cool that you do that. And that was my attitude. Well, now I'm sick. Now I'm really sick. And uh, I was very reluctant, but I finally took one, you know, took them aside and said, okay, like I need help. I can't figure out what's going on. And uh, we went deep. We talked about my, my relationship to food. We talked about, I did gut testing and I found I had all these different food intolerances and I learned about leaky gut syndrome and it looked like I definitely had all the symptoms of that and I had to completely eliminate certain foods out of my diet and I had to re-examine my supplementation, which was at this point I was addicted to taking supplements. And um, through that process of being forced to examine these things, uh, I kind of examined everything. And that's when my that's when I started looking at my training. That's when I started looking at I was I was able to open my mind and look up and figure out that eating small meals throughout the day is bullshit. There's no science supporting it. In fact, eating less frequently may be better for us. Mm-hmm. Um, the ridiculous amounts of protein that I was eating, uh, there was no science supporting it. Uh, there were you know high protein works for building muscle, but not the ultra high amounts that I was eating. My training changed. All these different things changed, and my body responded and. It was after that that I got the, I mean, aesthetically speaking, the best and most fit that I had ever been, but it was completely as a side effect. It was no longer my focus, or at least it gradually became less and less of my focus. I wasn't really caring so much about what I look like, and yet I looked better than I ever did before. And so that kind of changed my evolution. But I, for me, it required a massive wake up call. So it wasn't, it was gradual after that, but it was definitely mm-hmm. like a slap in the face. And if I ignored that, I'm sure I don't know if I don't know where I'd be right now. Yeah, I, I kind of remember uh, a moment. So for me, um, basically, like what happened, I was like such an intensity based person. And so um, all my workouts, like I had mentioned, like it, it was all about killing the workout, going max intensity. And uh, really, it wasn't until I had kids that like my first son was born that um, I just and, and, you know, thinking about this now, I, I didn't even really realize that that was probably the moment where. Um, it changed because my mentality would bleed through into um, just my temperament and my temperament um, always having to, um, you know, ramp myself up and get prepared to, you know, do really well in my workouts and, and um, move weight around. Like I had to really like keep that sort of intensity and, and carry that with me. And that just was not <laughs> I was, I was, I had no more sleep. You know, it's like I was irritated. Uh, it well, was just not going to benefit me anymore. The second your child is born, your, your purpose in life completely changes. Completely changes. My whole, my whole mindset towards, uh, my own health, wellness and well being uh, shifted. And, and even like leading up to that, I didn't even realize, but like I had like a tumor in my adrenal gland. Like I had to deal with like all these things that were kind of coming up as a result of the way that I was treating my body. And, um, yeah, so that was like a total like shift for me in the way now I have to approach, uh, just working out and having it benefit me more than, uh, me really trying to like always increase numbers and get better at performance. And, uh, you know, like, like, take on my workouts like it's this it's this like perform mentality always and the irony is then you perform better yeah i started performing yeah. better it was crazy yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly so. i i've had many <laughs> paradigm shattering moments in my my fitness career if i were to to pick the first big one i would probably have to say steroids in my early 20s um 
I think I was about 23 or 24 the first time that I did uh, any steroids. And before that, so I'd already been, I was a trainer by 20. So I had already knew my way around the gym um, and could get myself in pretty good shape. But I never, I always wanted to be like cover the magazine shape. And I'd never seen that. And after being a trainer, after training consistently in the gym for a long time, I was just certain that those guys were all on steroids and that's the difference between them and me. I work hard in the gym. You know, I'm consistent. I've been doing this for a long time. I know what I'm doing in here. Uh, These guys just must be on testosterone and I'm not. And I got, I took a huge stack because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Some some yeah. dude advised you, right? Some yeah, bodybuilder. Body okay, well, you know the the nice gentleman with the fanny pack. Yes, yeah, the, <laughs> the, the guy the guy selling yeah. you never take advice on how much you should take from the guy who's selling you. He has a he has a mullet and, and all that sounds uh, so stringer. obvious, but to a fucking young twenty three year old, of course, none of those light bulbs went off. I was just <laughs> at that. At, he's he was four times my size, and uh, by looking at him, obviously it, knew something yeah. more than I knew. Doing Pen- something right. thick veins. Yeah, the, yeah. You know, but, onion skin. Yeah. So yeah. he knew something that I. I didn't know and he had it right so i i dabbled in and out of that for probably three years and uh did enough damage to where i have to have hormone replacement therapy as a 35 year old man now if i want to have a normal sex drive and for and when i did it i i got bigger i got bloated looking like i got but i didn't get i didn't look like the men's health cover and that really was like a major moment for me that I didn't have this figured out. There was a lot more for me to learn. And that sent me searching, I think. I think before that, I think there was actually a little cocky arrogance. I mean, oh, I'm a personal trainer. I know a lot, this and that. And I thought that those guys were all on steroids. I needed to take steroids to look like that. I didn't. Ended up doing more damage than anything else. Never looked anything close to what any of those guys on a magazine look like. And then I went on my journey of really diving deeper and letting and getting my paradigm shattered many more times down the road for sure. Yeah, it's uh, most kids in that particular scenario like yours, Adam, they end up just going heavier and heavier and higher and higher doses. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's terrible to watch. Well, that that was even me. I mean, that's the reason why I said it went on for three years because it wasn't like I took my first cycle and I said... Like, oh, it doesn't work. It was like, oh, oh I, I just I, need more. Yeah, I need yeah. more of it. Like, what actually, the very first one, I still remember this day, because I was the skinny kid trying to get big, and the very first cycle I took, it was such a large cycle that all it really did was speed the fuck out of my metabolism, the, the super fast one I already had, and I couldn't eat enough calories. I was burning so much that I just got lean. I got ripped. I was super strong, so I was like this strong, skinny kid. So I was all of a sudden pressing, you know, I went from pressing 70-pound dumbbells to pressing like 130-pound dumbbells, but weighing a buck 85, you know, and I couldn't, it just didn't make sense to me. Like, what's going on here? So there was even an evolution of my steroid taking because I was just like, oh, or maybe it's not the right stuff. Oh, I need to do this more. So I went through this progression of trying all these different things until the light bulb finally went off that that's not the answer, you know, and it's not. And, and I think I, this is something I share a lot on the show because of my experience in that, because I'm trying to save a lot of kids that were that were my age when they were thinking like in your early 20s before you do something like that, because nothing sucked worse than being in my thirties and realizing that I actually have to have testosterone. So I have just, cause as a young kid, you don't ever think like you're such a horny kid that you don't ever think that you're going to like, I, I, I know we, I know every guy <laughs> oh, in this yeah. room can relate to being a 17 to 20 year old looking at a 40 year old who's, yeah. who says he never has sex. And you're going like, that'll never happen to me. Like <laughs> right. I fuck, that's all I want to do. In fact, it gets me in trouble. I all, that's all I want to do. In fact, I could probably use less of it in my life. And then it happens to you. And then, and then, so a guy like me who abused uh, testosterone ends up, you know, on the other end of the spectrum where you know it killed my sex drive and now that has become uh something that has put stresses on relationships like try being in a relationship with a a a woman now she thinks it has something to do with you know Mm so Mm -hmm. talk about all the problems that you just don't foresee and think about uh that it had caused in in my life so i speak really passionately about that to people in our audience that you know it's steroids aren't what everybody thinks they are. They think they're a lot more than what they are. There's genetics play a much bigger role. 
nutrition and programming is king over all things, and really that is the kicker that takes the the elite bodies to the next elite level. Yeah, you're you're starting to see this. So the, the reason why this happened with fitness with a lot of us, with most people, I'd say, who really get into it, is because fitness is so humans in general are like result driven and uh, you know aesthetic and what I can do with it. And mm -hmm. so once you mm -hmm. when you go into working out with that mentality then it's no it's not you end up making decisions based on that and the decisions end up being typically the wrong ones. You're actually starting to see and I want to touch on the subject. You're actually starting to see that happen with a lot of the brain hackers and the who want to optimize their learning and optimize their mental performance. Mm. You're seeing the same stuff where these guy these guys and girls are pushing it to the point where they may be not only getting diminishing returns but doing things that may be yeah detrimental to themselves well they can't eat enough nootropics i'll tell you yeah that right I mean, now. a lot of this stuff is so new we don't know what is going to happen after you know 20 years of taking modafinil right or, or i like i cannot believe that people you know like you know there's certain uh people out there in our world who talk about like it's this great nootropic like take modafinil modafinil's got long term has got some serious side effects for some people it's as documented will create facial twitches that never go away. Yeah. So you want to create some weird shit in your face forever. Most people I know who have experimented with it are only using it uh, very infrequently and, in, you know, and they know, and it's only like a short term thing. Like they're not using it every single day, but I, I, I do hear reports of a lot of people taking it Yeah, all, and like every I, single day. And, and it's just crazy. And like anything, you know, we, yeah. we push it to a limit and we end up with negative results. And so we'll see what happens in 10 years. But, you know, something that I realized, um, we talk about this on Mind Pump all the time, is if you want to optimize all performance, nothing, your body will always perform its best and maybe not its most extreme in one particular area. But when I say performance, I'm talking about broad spectrum, mm -hmm. full performance, the ability to think, the ability to relax, the ability to connect and love, the ability to, to be strong, to have stamina, to all the things that we talk about when we talk about total human performance or you know optimal performance or optimization it all of that comes from optimal health it, it, it not being super extreme in, in one thing and also not pushing yourself to a point where obviously you you, you hurt yourself or you get sick so being healthy you'll blow yourself away with how well you think and how fast you think and how great uh, your metabolism's responding you know because uh, you're healthy that's it it'll blow you away so mm -hmm. if you seek out if you're looking if you're truly looking for total uh, or or full spectrum performance on the whole body, mind, spirit. Uh, what you need to do is focus on optimal health, right. total health and longevity, mm -hmm. and then you'll achieve those things. It's not about the cos the cosmetic or the extreme performance. Well, one of the things people don't realize when they're chasing those other attributes, if if your body's not healthy, it's not going to devote resources to laying down new muscle tissue. Uh, you know, if you're spending too much time in the sympathetic state your body always thinks it's being chased by a saber tooth tiger. It's yeah. not going to devote resources to recovery. And you don't see the, all those performance aspects that we chase are just expressions of, you know, that that's, that's the epitome of how we express the, the qualities that we possess. You know, you want to, you want to have a 12 foot broad jump at the NFL combine. Sure. We can train for that, but you're not going to develop those qualities. You're not gonna be able to express that if you haven't, you know, created that foundation to begin with. It is, and that's why when I when I hear people, I've, we get lots of people asking us how they can improve their the performance of their brain, and I'll ask them about the nutrition and workout. Yeah, and, and they'll be like, no, 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 and, and sleep. Yeah, yeah and yeah, they'll yeah. be like, no, no, no I want to like, talk about listen, listen. I don't care what you take. Uh, take all the Adderall, modafinil, you know, microdose acid, whatever you want to do to optimize your brain. Uh, if you're not sleeping well and you're not eating right and not exercising right, you're not going to reach nearly. Your full potential. Well, we say the same thing about people that ask us what's the best muscle building supplement or, or what's the best yeah. fat burning is that well, let's look at your sleep, right. let's look at let's look at your nutrition, let's look at your programming. Like those are all much bigger rocks, like before you decide to take something else into your system that doesn't even make sense. Yep, absolutely. So that's a lot that's a lot about uh what mind bump talks about, which is also what's fucked us, you know, because these are the <laughs> these are the companies that pay podcasts like us yeah. to actually advertise Let's be completely them. transparent. <laughs> so yeah. I mean that's the tough part. Yeah. yeah. Before you guys walked in, we were talking about um owning gyms oh, and why what a great topic uh yeah right and uh it's it's funny right so you walk in here and ours looks kind of like a gym but really what we are we're the old retired guy who bought a bar yeah like it's not making any money 
it's, yeah. it's, it's just, just for us. We it's just for us party. and our friends yeah. to come on by and work <laughs> out. It doesn't need it. No one needs to do anything for yeah. it to, to pay for itself. Like that's literally. Uh, and, and I remember telling myself too, because of being a guy who operated a gym uh, for 10 years of my career and I was always responsible for anywhere between a quarter of a million to a half a million dollars a month of revenue. Uh, I know the stress, the hard work, the amount of people, uh, advertising, everything that comes with it. And the fact that revenue does not equal profit. Right. Exactly. Even a, a huge number like that, that was the big number, but we needed to hit at least 200 of that to be even making money, really. Right? Yeah, you know, it's funny uh, talking about that. So uh, I, I started my fitness career with 24 Fitness right around a little bit after when they uh, kind of melded or purchased uh, Ray Wilson's Family Fitness. So they were 24 Nautilus. They bought Ray Wilson's Family Fitness and became 24 Hour Fitness. And so I get in there and I remember learning the Ray Wilson uh fitness model versus the 24 hour Nautilus model. Now the 24 hour Nautilus gyms were out producing in terms of total revenue, the Ray Wilson uh, family fitness gyms. They were just huge numbers, but profit wise, the family fitness centers, the Ray Wilson family fitness centers were extremely profitable. And it was all in the, in the how it was all in how they set up their pay scale and how they managed the facilities. And at the family fitness facilities, uh, you were given a budget, Whatever you saved from that budget was yours. You kept it. You pay yourself. 24 Fitness gave you goals and gave you staff. And so the 24 Fitness clubs were hitting these big numbers, but the profit was, you know, they had a lot, they would have a certain amount of loss from supplements or whatever. Shit gets walked out the door. They would have staff and they're not being super productive. Lots of overtime. Lots of overtime. Lots of right. The Ray Wilson Family Fitness guys were in their bell to bell, very, very bare bones staff, saving money, and they were making more money as a result. And it was really funny to, to, to learn that as a young kid walking in going, oh shit, like that makes perfect sense. That had to have been such a valuable lesson as a businessman and entrepreneur. Oh God, we we talk about, I talk about 24 Hour Fitness. We all came from 24 Hour Fitness. Ironically, none of us really, well, Justin uh, worked with me, but Sal and I didn't know each other, uh, knew of each other, but didn't know each other. But I talk about 24 Hour Fitness as being like, um, it's like, it's a formula. Like bad parents. That's what I say. Yeah. So and by bad parents There are bad parents for sure. And what why I say bad, <laughs> bad parents. By bad bad parents, I love them and I I will always have a lot of respect for them because they taught me many things. Mm. But by bad, I mean like they're a bad they, example. They, they hit us around every once in a while. Well, they <laughs> But then they gave us an ice cream. After They're similar to the rest of the yeah. fitness industry of 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 preying on insecurities. Uh, you know, we were taught to sell to people based off their insecurity. Like I, I, I got well, all of us in here. Uh, all have records and sales. We were really good at what we did from that aspect. I don't think I was a very good trainer. I was good at selling you training, though. You know, I knew how to poke at your insecurities to get you to invest in lots of money on me and I got really fucking <laughs> yes. good at that and I and I justified it and was proud of myself for that because I got trophies for it and I got paid a lot of money to do it and you're do doing it. a good thing right yeah. you're getting them to work out and all that right. stuff you're so tricking them into fitness it taught me a ton about business with fitness it was an incredible teacher uh, from that aspect but I also think that back to the bad parents analogy that, you know, I we do things completely opposite and different, and that's a lot of our message well, is well, against that. I'll tell you what, working for 24 Fitness, because they were the first fitness company to hit a billion dollars in, uh, in, in value, um, and they did a lot of things right. And I had never, I took for granted because it was where I started, but they had statistics and tracking on so many different variables, and they taught the managers. The analytics were crazy. They taught yeah. managers uh, and staff how to read them, how to turn different knobs, and squeeze out rev revenue out of out of gyms. They also right. taught the sales process that was very very effective. And it wasn't just what Adam was talking about. There's actually a structure to it that's really really effective, and mm -hmm. it's actually the base of excellent communication. Twenty Four Fitness did such a good job of that, and then going into seeing other fitness organizations and other gyms and seeing how shitty they are and what it takes to really make a lot of money. When people ask me, hey man, I want to open a gym. What do you think? Is that a good idea? I'm like, you have no idea <laughs> yeah, what it takes to make a lot of money owning a gym. Right. It takes a lot and you're probably not going to do it. So not cut out for that. Yeah. yeah not, not a oh, good I idea. Oh, rem I remember all the time. Like, so, you know, I was have at all times I had anywhere between 15 to 25 trainers that were underneath me that I'd be hiring and mentoring and training and developing and, you know, it was always the guy or girl 
who was on the, the bottom 10 as far as performers, revenue, hour service, you know, so that they were the least busy, they weren't doing a lot of them, that would approach me after a year or so of, of training there and go, you know, this place isn't for me. I, I think I need to start my own. I'm going to do my own thing. And I'd just be like, oh, man, you don't want to do that. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're having a really tough time here. You have no fucking idea yeah. how much it's easier for you right now. When you walk out that door, it's going to get tough. But I'd always be supportive and hey, whatever, I'm always here. And I continued to mentor a lot of trainers after they moved on. But rarely ever did you see a, a trainer leave that unless they were like a top performer. Already. They got it. They figured the business model out. They were appreciative that they had these mm. 2,000 workouts a day. So they looked at it like, holy shit, this is 2,000 leads I'm getting every day. They were talking yeah. to members. They were booking free appointments. So they were doing all the things they had to do to build a very successful business. So that translated into the real world when they had it. But they all of them, I would tell you, and Justin can definitely talk about this because he went through this attribute, mm. like what a difference that is, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, even like you're explaining that for me, like, I recognized all those things right away. Like, oh my God, I'm getting all these leads. Like, my schedule is completely full. Like, I'm making, I'm, I ca- I'm capped out at the amount of money in revenue that I could possibly squeeze out of this company. And, you know, just, for me, it was all about the carrot in front of me and it was the upper management that, you know, the promises and this and that. And I just, I was so self-sufficient and and good at what I was doing uh, that I was pretty arrogant to where I was like, I'm out of here, you know, I'm going to do my own business. And then immediately being humbled because, you know, knowing that, but realizing how much money goes into just marketing yourself and then getting yourself out there, how much time that takes to rebuild an entire business, you know, around just yourself as a brand. And then, um, so that actually deterred me from wanting to open my gym. I was like, no way in hell. You know, I see all the staff, I see, you know, all these, these moving parts and, you know, people like, you know, like for the, for the majority, it's the low performers that are going to stick around. Right. So, you know, having to deal with that and manage a staff that's like uh, all, all your best people are going to leave I, and you have to realize that. It's so fascinating to hear both of you guys talk about, I was on the opposite end of the spectrum for both of those. So I was the guy when I opened, when I left Gold's gym, I was the guy who probably spent the least time on the training floor and, and in the facility. I probably brought in the lowest amount of revenue that a full-time trainer could bring in. Oh, wow. And I looked at, instead of looking at the opportunity for leads that were coming in, kind of as like shooting fish in a barrel, all I saw was the limitation of, okay, I'm in this city and I'm, I can only potentially train people who are members at this facility. So I saw it as a huge limiting factor. And I, in my mind, it was... If I'm going to put in, and as a trainer there, I think at the time I was making like 47% or something. So mm-hmm. it was less than half of, you know, so if somebody's paying me 50 bucks an hour for a session, I'm making like 2350. So I see all these numbers and I'm like, I can reach more people. I can put a hundred percent of that towards me and not somebody else, which again is one of the lessons. Once you start your own business, you learn the difference in revenue and profit, mm-hmm. but I thought completely differently, and and I wonder how many people who you know who are out there as trainers look at it one way or the I other. would say well, I would but, say you're the exception of people who sure. who did it and succeeded. Well, also, yeah, how yeah. did how did well, it all work out for you? Oh, actually? well, yeah. I mean, that was the thing is I knew, but I've always been sort of that person that you guys read Stephen Pressfield. Mm-hmm. Oh God, you got to just start reading Stephen Pressfield. Okay. Uh, Turning pro, do the work, and uh, I always say this one backwards. It's it's the war of art. Mm-hmm. not the art of war. Oh, okay. So his book is the war of art. Um, but he talks about something called the dead zone where like when you finish a project, you throw yourself back into the next one and, and you, you put yourself, a lot of people are such that they put themselves in a position where it's sink or swim. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's literally get this shit done or not be able to pay your rent and mm-hmm. put food on the table. And for me, I have always found that comfort is the enemy of motivation. Mm-hmm. And if I'm in a position where eh, I can work, the minimum mm. and bring in the minimum and be comfortable and have that lifestyle. Like I'll kind of do that. And I think that's human nature. But the second I put myself in that situation of shit, 
if I don't get more clients, if I don't build this thing, if I don't turn this thing into something, A, I'm not going to be able to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got a girlfriend. We just moved in together at that point in time. I've got to be able to pay my half of the rent. I've got to be able to get groceries. I like eating grass fed meat, which, you know, is more expensive than, you know, the bullshit chicken that you can buy at Walmart. And B, I'm going to be really embarrassed if this thing fails. You know, there's that whole ego side. Like Mm. people now see you're doing this, they know you're doing it. And so I think those are huge motivating factors. And, And it turned out really well. I mean, at, you know, at the time, this was 2012 when I started it. So you see all these people, you know, it's zero to six figures or like six yeah. figures is like that threshold. Like if it's like, if I can get there now, I know like, okay, I made it, I did mm-hmm. it. And so, yeah, I mean, it was there within a year and I mean, I guess I could say it worked out, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I quickly found, and I told you this before we sat down to record, I mean, two years into that, just the sheer, everything that you dump into it, you put all you have into building this thing and two years go by two and a half years. And it's just like, man, I'm, I'm so burnt out. I'm so oh, done. Yeah. And, and oh, yeah. I, I, I just didn't want to do that anymore. And I mean, I couldn't get out fast enough. It's you know, like I, owning a, yeah. I, I, I think the gym failure rate is probably higher than the restaurant failure mm-hmm. rate. It's, it's like tough one of those to scale. It's really yeah. tough to scale because especially it's completely dependent on you being there. Yeah. And you, and you only have so many hours a day. If, if you build it around you, right. there are a lot of people who are succeeding, lo- right. you know, putting the people in place and building a business. So if, if it can't run without you, it's not a business. It's just a hobby that makes money. Yep. 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 And a lot of people don't realize that when they're building their gyms. Right. And or you know, any business for that matter. Or any business. Right. But there are a lot of people who do realize it. And and I think it's there's I, when people start a gym now, there's so many resources out there. You know, you can find get the done for you systems and marketing and, and all this stuff. But I don't think there are enough people educating young gym owners on how to make it a business that can run without you and, mm-hmm. and to avoid that burnout and to avoid creating something that eventually you hate and, you know, because it drains you and takes everything. You know, away. who's doing that for the CrossFit community is Barbell Shrugged and Mike Bledsoe and those guys. I don't know if you know them. Are they, are they teaching people? I, I know they, that they're, they're coming up with the systems for these boxes to operate. For, for building it so that they don't necessarily have to be there all day, every day. Yeah, yeah. lead generation and, yeah. I mean, just the whole business side of it. I'll say I'll say this. A lot's changed since I managed big box gyms. Uh, what I see now, and it's, it's real evident now, is that the big box gyms are not where the growth is in the brick and mortar fitness industry. Right. Uh, the growth is in the small box, mm-hmm. uh, more of the niche uh, type training type stuff. So like yoga mm-hmm. studios, mm-hmm. Pilates studios, bar classes, CrossFits, you Those know, that kind of stuff. Bar theory. classes have just exploded in yeah. Orange Theory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so if, if you're a trainer, um, first off, it's very expensive, very difficult to compete with big box gyms. So you can do it. You can open a big box gym, a lot of moving parts, going to cost you a lot of money, mm-hmm. and you're going to compete with companies that have been doing this for a long time who are probably going to kick your ass. So, my recommendation would be to go small, focus on something that's a little different. Uh, whether it be spin bikes or yoga or whatever that appeals, it's a little bit different. It's got that feel to it mm-hmm. and have a little bit of a higher cost uh, per person coming in. So it's a high service, high cost, lower volume type model. Mm-hmm. And then l- systemize that and learn how to well, get that. And CrossFit's a perfect example of this. They're a perfect example of that growth mm-hmm. uh, in Orange Theory, all of them. What I th- Why I think that is, my theory on that has a lot to do with our ability now with social networks to create this this uh, this community, mm-hmm. a different type of community that we couldn't what we couldn't do 15 years ago. Oh, yeah. Like our community was literally within the gym, was only in the gym and didn't extend expand yeah, was, right. beyond yeah, that. It was, was your lifting group and then the other guys that you knew that right. You know, you where could, where now like you these and you you can see it too. So I was I was a part of the first orange orange theories that came to San Jose. My buddy owns a bunch of them and uh, helped them start. And you can see uh, even the the systems that they put in place right now to connect to the members. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they put a lot of emphasis on the social media side of it and the networking and the connecting to each other and the competitions and the creating that community. Well, that's why Fitbit, like like they are leading the way as far as wearables are concerned because their entire focus was on their community. Mm. And and that was so big because now everybody's uh, connecting, interacting with family 
family members, friends, all this stuff online. Like it, it really wasn't about, I mean, they have a quality product as far as like step count and all that's concerned, but really they just, they focused like most of their attention. How can we get them to connect and interact with each other, whether it's leaderboards or whatever it is. Uh, they made a really like their entire UI is focused on that. And I think that's 100% the reason why they just went a bit uh, ahead of everybody. That's a great point. Cause there are a lot of wearable fitness yeah. trackers out there and Fitbit is definitely at the top of that market. I'll tell you what though, the book uh, that I'm reading is uh, that was the one thing where I'm kind of the, the verdict isn't out yet with me on it because they actually think that uh, as when we were talking about addictive and being connected and things that could be end up being bad for us, they actually talked a lot about uh, wearables and saying that they could be uh, the worst that this whole, uh, because of the steps and the leaderboards and the progression of people like just trying to get more and more and more and more and more and, and, and you're becoming so dependent on that. Yeah. Um, so there's de there's definitely a side that is arguing the the negative side. And I'm a huge I actually make anybody who's ever been coached by me in the last three years. It, it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. I make you get a wearable mm -hmm. because I have been able to coach so much more precisely when I can tell what's, what's going on. Well, I mean, you guys have known this from the very second you started in fitness. You, if, if somebody, best case scenario, you train them three or four times a week, you get them for four hours, you have no idea what they're doing the other 160-some right. hours a week. And now with, with wearables, you can see how they're sleeping. And it's not just when they come in, you ask them, you know, how'd you eat? How are you sleeping? Right, because we know that's fucking way off. Right. Now you <laughs> can look at this and you can tell exactly. It's, it is beautiful for coaching, especially like virtual and, and online right. remote coaching. Yeah, I think anything that humans uh, adopt strongly, they do it because there's benefits, but there's also always with anything with that much power, there's potential. You still negatives. have to know when to put your tools down. You know, like we like we can use it, but then we also have to step outside of it as well. And I think that you know we're still figuring out what that looks like, and it, it could totally it could feed into your you know obsession with like like hitting metrics and, and numbers, and you know that's the same thing as me chasing a PR all the time and like always like trying to get to that uh, you know within my workout. Uh, it's not going to benefit my body necessarily. There's a quote, we, we recently had uh, Chris Dancy on our podcast, the world's most connected man, and he shared a quote, I forget who said it, but we don't know how to measure what we value, so we value what we measure. Mm. And that can be Powerful. said for, for squatting. You mm -hmm. know, if you're a power lifter and you're always chasing a squat or a deadlift number. It's true. If you're an obstacle course racer and you're always chasing, uh, you know, a time or mm. a distance, if, if you're chasing a number of steps or calories or sleep metrics. I think that's in part the probably the fault of uh what's what's been so glorious about modern uh, mankind is that we discovered how to measure and test and you know live in this world of measurement and testing and it's benefited us in great ways i mean uh, you know the industrial revolution and the agricultural revolution and the scientific method these all came from being able to do that but we may have lost our ability to sit quietly and uh, you know, self-examine or to come up with the, those ideas or to connect with things other than things. And um, this may be why in, at this particular time now in history, you're seeing uh, people who have money spend it on doing that. Go, you, know, yeah. I, I, you know how many people I talk to now that are super successful like executives – who fly down to South America to do ayahuasca ceremonies right. because that helps them out. And, it's and, like, and that, was, that was one of the things that, that was posited in the, the Rise of the Suffer Fest documentary. The guy's mm -hmm. like, you know, it is the epitome of elite privilege to pay $150 to go run through the mud and crawl under barbed wire <laughs> yeah. and, you know, do these obstacles outside. I mean, really, like... We're paying. We're, we're paying we're, for shit that we used to do all the time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, man, I pay a gym membership to go lift heavy shit and not do anything with it. I'm not building anything. I'm just lifting heavy shit yeah, and putting it down. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, and I mean, it's just I don't know. It's I just like I, farm work. I know? tell like, people right now, like replacing farm work. If you want a place to invest in, invest in all of the. Uh, businesses that are popping up that are, are counter this, right? Oh, so yeah. that your are float tanks, your float that tanks, well, that's your, the day, one was, your that's, day spa. That's actually what I was going to bring up exactly because you were saying how hard it is to just sit and, and meditate and think and be, yeah. you know, 150 years ago, it was nothing to just sit on the front porch and just, you know, watch the world go by and think. Now we're, I literally, I was thinking that as you were saying it, and, and that's what just slipped my mind was we pay to go sit in a float tank. Yeah. We're paying for sensory deprivation because we're so we don't know how to do it. We're, yeah. we're, and and we're, we're more stimulated now than we've ever yeah. been. Yeah. There's a study, 
So I love this one. This is crazy. Um, 19, uh, no. So in 2007, they did a study that found that we consume 174 newspapers that are like 85 pages in length worth of information every single day. Wow. And we produce six of those newspapers with what we text and email and say. And that was in 2007. There wasn't Instagram back then. Mm -hmm. Twitter was a baby. Facebook was maybe in colleges only. So, I mean, we're talking probably an order of magnitude higher now with what comes in. And and that's just like communication. Yeah, overstimulation. Yeah, and and it's called excitotoxicity. Uh, so so your nervous your, your neural cells are just constantly being bombarded. Overstimulated. Yeah, and so we have a neurotransmitter GABA that, you know, is responsible for, you know, um it's it's the inhibitory neurotransmitter that it counteracts that serves as the brakes and it, it that's why you're seeing so many people turn into alcohol or some other altered state. Yeah, mm-hmm. Marijuana raises mm-hmm. GABA too. You can, this is why you're going to see, though. You're going to see um, – invest in that for sure. I mean, you see uh, people like Elliot Hulse getting into – his starting his grounding camp, camp business. You're seeing the float tanks starting to pop up. Your day spas are packed like crazy now. I mean, I'm, shit, our best affiliate that we have out of everything that's connected to us is our Brain FM. Why? Because it really fucking makes a huge difference for people right now. We're so tapped in and connected – and it was a game changer for me was to get this silly little app mm-hmm. that I can listen to that helps me focus or meditate or sleep mm-hmm. because through the sounds. And it just totally relaxes me. And it was a game changer. We had those guys on our podcast probably in, so over a year ago. How are you connected with them? Oh, uh, God. So we interviewed, we interviewed we um, interviewed Kyle Kingsbury. So Kyle Kingsbury, a good friend of ours, ex-MMA yeah. fighter, kind of connected us. And we... Met with them and we tried their app out. We extremely, we were all very, very. Do you very use skeptical. the sleep version? I use all of it. Oh, it's a, the sleep I, one's amazing. Oh, yeah. it's and focused. Yeah. I really like I, focus. Yeah, that's my, I my use, go-to. I use it all, and I use it pretty, pretty regularly. I there's it doesn't a week doesn't go by that I don't use it at least once. Um, but I do. I like anything else. I try to be intermittent about anything. Like I don't ever like to become dependent on something. But man, it would take a day where my business brain's flying like crazy. Mm-hmm. And, and I know all entrepreneurs I know can connect to this. Like you lay in bed and your body may be tired and you're telling yourself you got to go to bed because you got to get up at five or four in the morning. <laughs> but your brain Still is telling running those things over you, and over. Yeah. million things going and nothing has been. And I'm and I'm pro cannabis for that reason, too, because that's been the one thing that I've that's kind of helped me settle that down. The only thing that's ever surpassed that was Brain FM, was being able to put those headphones on, put it in sleep, put it in meditate, and and then I'll do like a little breathing, like some box breathing. It'll it'll put me right down. It's mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. Game changer. Yeah. I, I, because of the, the modern world, we're just going to have to plan. We're just going to have to plan and figure these things out. It's not on that. It doesn't happen every day now because that's the way we live. Yeah. It, it's, it's only going to happen if we schedule it unfortunately and plan for it same reason why you have to make time to exercise is because if you don't you don't fucking move but you know 400 years ago nobody needed to plan to exercise yeah Yeah. movement they exercised on accident you know what i mean life was exercised everything right exactly Exactly. yeah so today you know you need to schedule and plan these things and again the return on investment is in my experience uh it's incredible it's incredible so you will be more productive anyway so for those of you listening who are you know, freaking out like I don't got time to schedule a float tank, or I don't, I don't want to. You know, and you'll learn more efficiently. You'll too. do better you're, with you're it. You're the person that needs it most. Yeah, yeah exactly. And you'll and you'll do better uh, as a result. So, yeah. man, what a pleasure, dude! Yeah, yeah. it's been a blast. Thank yeah. you guys. Yeah, Excellent. it was a, it was a great time having you down here, man. We're gonna have to do this uh, more often for sure. I Very cool. That. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, 
And you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support. And until next time, this is Mind Pump. Mind Pump.